We're up and we're recording. Okay, I think our technical difficulties are solved. Unfortunately, this room is still not tight. So we're all gonna be shouting as best we can and taking off our masks, uh, if we please. I'm not gonna repeat the first two lines again. I think you know who I am. I think you feel welcome to this meeting. But let me begin by thanking our in-person and remote attendees for joining. Thank you to the members of the redistricting task force for all of your efforts over the past months and for coming to speak with us today. Thank you to members of the public and community organizations for the thoughtful comments we have received over the past days. Thank you to the representatives from the League of Women Voters, the ACLU, and Asian Americans Advancing Justice for your letters. This level of public engagement from all sides is impressive and appreciated. As authorized by California Government Code Section 54953E and Mayor Breed's 45th supplement to her February 25th, 2020 emergency proclamation, it is possible that some members of the Elections Commission may attend this meeting remotely. In that event, those members will participate and vote by video. Members of the public may attend the meeting to observe and provide public comment at the physical meeting location and the ability listed online. Secretary Delgadillo, could you please explain some procedures for today's meeting? Thank you, Vice President um, Chapel. The minutes of this meeting will reflect that due to the COVID-19 health emergency and to protect commission members, city employees, and the public, um, we are conducting this meeting in City Hall and online on WebEx. Uh, this precaution is taken uh, due to the various local, state, and federal orders and declarations. Public comment will be available on each item on this agenda. Each member of the public will be allowed two minutes to speak. Comments or opportunities to speak during the public comment period are available by calling 1-415-655-0001. That number again is 1-415-655-001. Access code is 2493-990-0965. Once again, 2493-990-06, I'm sorry, 0965. When, it, when your item of interest comes up, to those who are joining us through the internet, please dial star three to raise your hand. You will then hear your hand has been raised and for you to, if you have questions, please wait until the host calls on you. The line will be silent as you wait your turn to speak. Of any equipment around you, especially your computer, if you are watching via the web link, to prevent feedback and echo. When the system message says your line has been unmuted, this is your turn to speak. You are encouraged to state your name clearly and spell it out, please. As soon as you begin, you will have two minutes to provide public comment. Uh, you will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you change your mind and wish to withdraw yourself from the public comment line, Press star three again. You will hear the system say you have lowered your hand. When a phone is not available, you can use your computer web browser. Make sure the participant side panel is showing by clicking on the participants icon. Make sure the participants panel is extended in the side panel by pressing the small arrow indicator in the panel. You should see a list of panelists followed by a list of attendees. At the bottom of the list of attendees is a small button or icon that looks like a hand. Press the hand icon to raise your hand. The host will unmute you when it's time for you to comment. When you are done with your comment, click the hand icon again to lower your hand. Public comment instructions are also on page four of the agenda. Public comment may be submitted in writing. It will be shared with the commission after this meeting has concluded and will be included as part of the official meeting file. Written comments should be sent to elections.commission.sf.org. Thank you, Vice President Chapel. Thank you. With that, I'll call the meeting to order. Secretary Delgadillo, will you please proceed with the roll call?
Sure. President Bernholz, are you in? Are you here. present? Here. I, I I know that you're present remotely, but you can unmute your here. your um. I'm oh. here. Martha, she's here. Thank you. Vice President Chapel. Here. Commissioner Dye. Commissioner here. Jordanic. Thank you. Here. Commissioner Shapiro. And Commissioner okay. Jung. Here. With six in attendance, we meet forum. Oh, Great. Thank you. Moving to item two on our agenda discussion and possible action regarding election commission appointees to the San Francisco redistricting task force. While I cannot speak on behalf of the elections commission, I have a few opening remarks as the acting chair of this meeting. We have received hundreds of emails, letters, and public comments calling for the removal or not of our appointees to the redistricting task force. However, from my perspective, this meeting has been called for the purpose of allowing our appointees to respond publicly to public concerns that have been directed to the Elections Commission regarding the redistricting task force decision making process. Moreover, it bears reminding that the Elections Commission is not responsible for drawing, discussing, or debating specific maps. That is the work of the redistricting task force, and it is work that this Election Commission should not disrupt or influence. The three members of the redistricting task force appointed by this elections commission were appointed in good faith, and we are confident in our transparent appointment process. Our June 2021 process was based on that use 10 years prior, was informed by some of the same community members and organizations that have reached out to us this week. And all materials and decisions from that process are archived on the election commission's website. Upon the swearing in of our appointees, it is my understanding that the election commission's role with respect to the redistricting is complete and the election commission has been uninvolved with the redistricting task force. This commission understands that redistricting is a complicated process and that transparency is an important part of that process. With that in mind, we have invited our appointees to this meeting to address four points. One, Without getting into specifics of the maps themselves, what process occurred between Saturday and Monday? And we're referring to the most recent Saturday and Monday. Can you describe the process by which the redistricting task force tracks and accounts for public input from communities? Three, can you describe the process by which the redistricting task force evaluates and establishes priorities for the purpose of drawing maps and what factors do you consider? Four, can you confirm the redistricting task force commitment to and describe some of the actions you have taken for the purpose of reflecting communities of interest within the city and county of San Francisco? I will ask each appointee these four questions before moving on to the next appointee. I invite my fellow commissioners to interject with relevant follow up questions as and when appropriate. Since you are three in attendance, would one of you like to speak first? Thank you, Mr. Cooper. And I will repeat the questions for you. Okay, so the first question. Oh, I guess that doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. First question, without getting into the specifics of the maps themselves, what process occurred between Saturday and Monday? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, uh, without getting into the specifics, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the maps and, and, or, and talk about that process. Um, the first, um, on Saturday, we Saturday was our first meeting after a week break that uh, lined up with the Board of Supervisors recess. Going into that into that meeting, we had a meeting right before that break where we asked our redistricting consultant, P2 redistricting consultants, uh, to bring us a, a set of maps. And we had a, a long discussion at that meeting uh, based uh, and uh, talking about what sort of things we want to see on those maps. Uh, this is this was our going into our fourth round of doing that, we asked them to do that once to get us started. And that created a map that was 1A. Talked about 1A, gave them instructions to create a 2A and a 2B. We advanced one of those maps. 
then we, we had them create a 3A and a 3B, and then we advanced one of those maps. And then after working with 3B for, for a while on the prior Saturday, we uh, asked Q2 to send us back, um, to bring us back four maps. And we gave them a um, long set of instructions. I don't have them with me right now, unfortunately, but we gave them a set of instructions. And what they, they do is they, they do their best to make maps that um, that meet those instructions that are, are legal maps within within the guidelines, and then they also take into account uh, the feedback that we we received. And the way they do that is, in addition to just the census blocks, which are our building blocks for redistricting, uh, they also have access to the uh, our cultural districts, uh, our community benefit districts, and most importantly, our communities of interest. So. Uh, to take things back a little bit further, uh, we'd spent much of January and February uh, and March having district specific meetings where we, uh, our original plan was to have those in district, but with Omicron, we, we had to have those first remotely and then at City Hall. Uh, but we had an agenda item for each district and members, we did outreach to that district, members of the public from that district or with a relationship to that district were invited to come and give testimonies to their communities of interest. Uh, just as a reminder, communities of interest are geographical areas that have some sort of shared social, uh, cultural, socioeconomic um, uh, status uh, that brings them together. So we took those submissions and any submission that we received, either in person, via email, um, you know, on online through our web form, that was mappable, that had, was given with actual boundaries of the streets, um, was mapped by Q2 and added into our database. I don't have the number on the top of our head, but it, as time has gone on, it, the numbers really started to blossom. So Q2, when they're making the maps, takes into account those communities of interest that we've received, as well as, as the other geographies, as well as the uh, SF uh, neighborhoods map as um, created by the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services um, a, a few years prior to this. So that so we, we, we gave Q2 the instructions. One of the maps that we, we came with um, was 4A, which was a map based on the discussion that we had on that prior Saturday. And then there were three new maps created, 4B, 4C, and 4D. Um, with the draft, draft mapping process, uh, it's th this stage, I know it's, it's relatively close to the deadline, but we were still at a place where we feel, feel like we were relatively early on. And when we were looking at maps, we were evaluating uh, not just the specific choices that those maps made, but where they stand as a starting point for future discussion and future mapping. So on that on that um, Saturday, uh, that the most recent Saturday, we, we, we voted to advance map 4B, um, as in Delta, to um, the mapping, uh, to, to the mapping. And I think, I think for a lot of us, I think, at least for me in particular, but I think for everyone on the task force, we felt um, that with some tweaks, it might have been the best possible basis for a map that did keep communities of interest whole and responded to the feedback we received. Um, so we go to Monday, uh, and Monday we we get we have public comment, and then we get started to working on the map. And um, for D, uh, it seemed to be that it was going to be a much more difficult starting point than we had imagined. Um, we edited and discussed it for over two hours with different configurations, balancing the needs of communities of interest, uh, as well as our requirements to retain, uh, to remain within 5% of the mean district. Uh, and we, we had some, some really serious discussions. We, we moved various different parts of the map just to try to make things balance. We had even had a motion to, to, to make a move that did not pass that affected the kind of the, the viability of the rest of the map. Uh, at a certain point, we got to a point where the only the only way forward with that map was, was either to make some some changes that we that we did not feel as a task force we were going to we were comfortable making, and or changes that would have fundamentally um, you know changed the the makeup of the of the map. You know, we on Saturday we did hear. Um, feedback, we hear feedback and support for both map 4D and 4B, uh, and in that feedback, um, you know, 4B and 4D, those are just letters and lines. I think when we heard the feedback in, on 4D, people gave feedback about specific aspects of that map that they, they felt were important, and given where we were on Monday night, it didn't seem like that there was a way possible, way forward on 4D, 
that would have made it a 4D that those members of the public would have supported. I think the changes necessary to that map to break to keep it within compliance, um, given the the discussion and given the the uh, guidelines we set up for ourselves in that discussion, would have um, would have made that a completely different map. So we 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 made the, the choice to uh, to to you know call it call it there and and just choose to discuss a different map. And I think. It's really important to be clear that we that this was not a flip flop or a reversal. We we spent a lot of time making di making discussions about the various lines, the various districts on the map, and we could not have, we could not find a viable solution um, that we could agree upon to to move that map forward. Uh, and this was like I said after hours hours of work. Um, and and to address the the time of the vote, I I will you know admit that two fifty three a.m. Probably not an ideal time to have a vote, but we were less concerned about how late into the night it was and more concerned with how late into the calendar we were as a, as a task force. And if I, I felt that if, and we felt that if we didn't have that vote at 2.53, whatever it was, Tuesday morning, Monday night, um, that we would have likely have had that same vote or a similar vote on Wednesday. And that's so much further down the calendar. And I think by having the vote when we had that vote and having having that discussion, having that complete and frank discussion, and then having that when we, we had it gave the public an opportunity to, to respond to what they heard and gave the public an opportunity to compare and contrast um, those options uh, and gave us an opportunity to learn more about some of the trade-offs that we're going to have to make. Yeah, this is a very difficult process, a lot of very complex trade-offs, and I think this gave us an opportunity to, um, this gave us an opportunity to really Weigh those trade offs and talk about these trade offs um, and 1 more point. I know I know I've gone long here. 1 more point. I do want to make because this is very important. Uh, we did not kill any maps. We did not. Take anything off the table um, in the, in that motion. We, we, we never have. We've had. We've had consensus moves. We've had votes, um, but we did not kill map 4 D at that meeting. Um, it is it, we. Sort of left it as it is. It became for DA. It remained in our tracker. It remained something. Remained something we discussed. We are still discussing it. We may still discuss it at some point between now and Saturday. We just felt like, based on the state of our discussion and based on the state of the maps, that 4B was going to be a more productive place for us to begin drawing the next day. Yeah. So I don't know what the trajectory of the number of public. Members of the public present during that evening, but um, could you tell us like how many members of the public were present either online or in person during that vote? And also, what was the like the, the last public comment in relation to that motion? Um, that's a great question. I could uh, I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, and I I wasn't paying attention to the web act. I couldn't really really see that. Um, I will say that. Um, and that, that's something that we may be able to try to try to provide at a later time. Um, I will say that we had this meeting started at five thirty. We we had some discussions and then then public the public comment on the mapping. We decided to go with that first before we we dug into the mapping. The main reason for that is is translators. We've had uh, a number of speakers, uh, primarily Cantonese, but other languages speaking, and we have the translators up until a certain time. Um, and we we felt that it was it made sense for us to have that public comment first. The, the downside of that being that that pushed the discussion far later into the evening. Um, and uh, in terms of the number of people there, uh, I, I would say that there are a lot of people who made public comment and then left. And I would say roughly the number of people who were there at the end of the, that mapping public comment, which was around 11 p.m., a lot of those same people were there straight through till till 3 a.m. And we did receive, we had general public comment after, and we had general public comment. Um, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but we did have general public comment after that. And I think, you know, at, at this point, thankfully, you know, we had, for a long time, we were sort of toiling in obscurity for a little bit. But thankfully, at this point, there are a number of reporters and journalists who are, are covering this, uh, and a number of members of the community, prominent um, coalition builders within the community. Um, and it, it, you know, people found out about it very, very, very quickly. I, I have email. We had an email right at eight, eight in the morning uh, the next day expressing disappointment. So, I think um, the time, the time of the vote, I don't think made any difference in, in what what the vote would have happened. And I think the ability for 
the ability for the public to see the vote, um, I, I think, didn't, didn't make a difference on the on the vote itself and on the discussion we had. Thank you. I have a question. Sure. Um, during public comment uh, on at Wednesday's hearing, uh, we heard uh, a suggestion that there's no civil or criminal penalty associated with not abiding by the city charter. Uh, we, we haven't been separately advised by the city attorney's office yet, probably because it was 48 hours ago or less. But, uh, you know, with respect to that reference to the April 15th date in the city charter, uh, you mentioned that uh, 253 a.m. was, you know, maybe not an ideal time to take that vote, but you were uh, as or more concerned about the proximity of the April 15 uh, deadline. Uh, can you explain what, what's the uh, significance of that deadline outside the fact that it's uh, stated in the city charter? Uh, thank you. Um, so April 15th is exactly as you mentioned, stated in the city charter. And to be clear, um, and as I'm saying this, I, I, I do hope that their city attorney will correct me if I say anything um, very incorrect. But um, my understanding is that it's before April 15th, so technically April 14th at 1159. Um, and there is state legislation around voting rights that say we have to have a draft map posted 72 hours before. So we have to have a meeting that creates that map. That map has to be up for 72 hours, and then we can approve it as a body. Um, the and, and we can make very minor, mostly clerical modifications to it at that time. So really our April 15th is the charter deadline, um, kind of it's April 14th, technically, technically based on the meetings that we have currently scheduled. April 9th, and, and we've been clear with the public about this, April 9th is really the last day that we can, can do any major mapping. Uh, that can go in a little bit into that Sunday if we need to, but April 9th is that last day we can make any real mapping. Um, and I think felt that if we were gonna make a, make a broad change, I think you know, that uh, ahead of time was, and that April 9 deadline that's driven by state law. Um, the, I believe the three, the three day posting period of the map, I believe is state law. Um, and then the April 15th deadline is in the city charter. Thank you. And, and to, to that, to that end, I asked, um, I've, I've inquired about what happens if we don't hit that deadline and it's, we've gotten sort of a shrug. It's kind of, we are not, we're not sure what happens after that. So. We're, we're, we have that very front of mind. That's very important to us. Hi. So there have been some allegations in the media that some of the members have been acting on behalf of certain, like, kind of political factions within the city. And between those two votes on that evening, were there? Um, did you like receive any lobbying communications, like emails or texts from any of these people? Between the Saturday vote and the Monday vote. Between the the vote for the um, 4D followed by the the, the vote of I, P3 the I did not. Um, yeah, I, and I I think we we take the, our commitment very seriously. Um, it is a commitment to not drawing lines based on political preferences, political parties, and that's something we take very seriously. Uh, it's been difficult for us these last week or so because we've had so much public comment that's based on asking us to draw districts that keep a certain uh, political faction in, in the whole landscape happy. Um, and that's been, um, it's been, it's been you know, difficult for us to, to parse through that, but I, I can, I can assure you that all, all my members are acting in good faith to that, to that commitment, including myself. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up on Commissioner uh, Jung's question. Um, so, uh, first of all, thank you for your service. I've been where you are um, being. Uh, redistricting commissioner or task force member is um, uh, uniquely um, <laughs> challenging. So uh, I appreciate the, the hard trade off that, that you're trying to make. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the timeline that the task force set out for draft maps? Because California Citizens Redistricting Commission you know, had a constitutional deadline of June 15th, put out the first draft maps in order that we could do a final map with time for public input and time for us to revise it or our August 15th deadline. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, what was the timeline for the draft maps? Because it 
you said this was the fourth round. Mm -hmm. have, have there, has there been an official release of a draft map? Um, thank you for that question. Well, there has not been an official, uh, we, we've have, we have our draft maps. We haven't made a, a distinction yet as to what an official draft map is. And I think we're, we're still in, in the process of creating that. I think with, with this process, um, we, we really emphasize the, the community of interest input, and we really wanted that to not be um, not be tainted by the, the sort of some of the, the political uh, conversations that we've heard recently. We wanted to have that be separate um, before before the mapping. Uh, so we, we've not released a draft map, but we've had at each stage, we've had these draft maps that we've been, been working off of, and all of our proceedings, everyone gets to see how the sausage gets made. All of our proceedings have been public and in public meetings. So. Okay, so if I understand correctly, there has been no official draft map released yet. I uh, I would not. Uh, I don't. I don't know if I would characterize that. I, I I don't know what the sort of marker for official is. If there's if there's one. Yeah, no, we had to like officially release it and post it for a certain number of days, and so our, ours was an official draft map. I think in that in that context, no. But we've had you know multiple draft maps that we've been working working through in this process. Okay, so so we called those kind of early um, drafts. We called them visualizations because we wanted to distinguish between the draft map. And so, as I understand, there has been, but there has not been an official draft map, and these are all visualizations. That's a, I would say that's a fair characterization. Okay, and then just to um, understand the math here, you said there's a 72 hour posting deadline with the Brown Act. Mm -hmm which would be then April 12th, but then you also mentioned April 9th. Is that your deadline for a draft map? Right, so we, we do not have a meeting. I think our, we wanna give time to, for, to make sure that we get everything uh, posted and, and set. Um, and we also do not have a meeting on the, uh, on the 12th. We don't have a meeting on the 12th. We would have to set it on the ninth and vote it on it on the thirteenth. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, <clears throat> Mr. Cooper. I'm Robin Shapiro. Um, I'm a new commissioner, and I just wanted to say thank you for your service. Um, I imagine this has been a very difficult process, and I just wanted to say thank you um, to start and. Um, I just wanted to follow up on a quick question, if you don't mind. Um, following your the beginning of the task force in September, can you talk about the step from September to um, the meetings in January and February, and then the first release of the map in March? I was trying to follow the element of the um, the four A and four. Sorry, when you presented the 4B, 4C, and 4D, because you had said something to the effect of it was relatively early on in, in that process. And then later on, um, the explanation for the um, late night uh, change or move um, without putting words into your mouth. I want to just, I re recall you saying something to the effect that it was how late in the calendar that that was more of what your intention was with doing it at that hour. Um, so could you just kind of walk through how you got to that specific point from like a date standpoint? I think that would just really help me understand the big picture here. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, we were, um, we were, I was the three of us were appointed in June. Uh, the mayor's appointees were appointed a little bit later, as, as well as the board of supervisors appointees. There was some delay uh, of unknown origin, but we, we didn't really get started until September. And the whole process was was delayed a little bit because the charter requires um, requires the census data to be published before the, the task force is created. Um, and the census, there were delays with the census data this year and the various um, relationships to that. So we were pushed pushed back slightly because of that. And a note, a note to any future charter amendment writers: we're going to have to redistrict every ten years. So hopefully that that census. Uh, that census uh, starting point uh, was away, but um, yeah. I, so so we started in, in September, and a lot of 
September, October, November was um, us trying to, to do our best in terms of first figuring out who we are as a body. We were at that point meeting remotely um, and we still had to, we, we came in with no schedule, no, uh, just some draft bylaws that we had to approve. We had to, to get through all, all of that process. We also had to get to know our consultants. We have Q2 uh, redistricting consultants who were helping with the, the mapping process um, and helping, as I mentioned, with the community of interest input. Uh, they also did. They also created our redistricting mapping tool, which we did iterations on helping them out with. That's what allows members of the public and members of the task force to create and submit um, maps based and it allows you to select census blocks and count how many people live in that census block. Um, so we had to, to work with them on that. Um, we also had an outreach consultant, Civic Edge Consulting, uh, and we worked with them on, on planning outreach and we had some, some back and forth and, and changes on, on the exact scope of their work and, and, and what they would do, but we ended up getting setting them up for that. Um, and then we sort of hit a, an odd point where in December we were, we were getting ready to schedule our first big round. We were gonna do 11, 11 meetings in each of the 11 districts community meetings and then we had omicron happen and so we had to we had to delay the start of that sort of for a second and hoping that we would be able to actually do those in person uh, but that didn't end up working out so we ended up doing those all remote and that sort of pushed that back a little bit um we had conversations at the time about just going ahead and starting the mapping earlier um uh, at the time you know we decided that it was important, really important to really focus on, on that community of interest input because um, we knew that was going to be so important uh, in building those kind of building blocks for the rest of our mapping process. So, so that meant that we had those meetings and then we sort of began the mapping process in earnest at the beginning of March. Um, and that kind of leads us to where we are today. Thank you. Just a follow up question. Um, that all is very helpful in getting to what happened leading up to um, Omicron and then kind of thereafter. But can you talk a little bit about what happened after the first map was released in terms of the timeline? Just so I understand, once the first draft was or design was released, um, as it's not a specific draft, the design was released, the lines were drawn um, to the point of uh, the week before the change um, that is in question, I suppose. Um, can you just kind of talk more specifically about that timeline? Sure. So um, don't don't have all the dates on top of my head. No problem. No problem. But we had um, we did have a map one A um, that I believe was released sometime right around the middle of March, and that was just based on our first set of instructions to Q two. We were finishing up a, a second round of of district meetings, and then we we had one A one A. Was the, the was a map that had a lot of issues. Um, so we so we then starting the week of starting two weeks before I guess around the, the week of the seventeenth I would say we had we were going right into mapping meetings and what those were is we would take that take whatever draft map we had um, give comments and feedback and then create a set of instructions for Q two to come back with us to make those new sets of maps. So. So we did 1A, and then we got 2A and 2B, and then we got 3A and 3B. Um, and then going into that that break that we had where we couldn't schedule any meetings because of the, the recess, uh, I insisted that and, and we agreed that we should have uh, more than two maps. And we, went, we ended up with four maps. Uh, and those the first map was based on what we did that day. So that came out, uh, I believe, that next day, basically, or, or the day after. Um, and then the other three maps that Q2 put together um, came out after that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. I appreciate mm -hmm. that you covered a lot of ground in that in that first question. Um, as we go through the next ones, if you feel you've already touched on something, feel free to sure. kind of note that and pass through. We're also aware that we only have thirty minutes left until your meeting, and and certainly we don't want to hold up the process um, from a timing perspective. So. We'll try to go quickly and um, make time for, for your fellow uh, task force members. So second question, can you describe the process by which the redistricting task force tracks and accounts for public input from communities? Sure, um, yeah, so I had mentioned the, the community of interest um, feedback that Q2, Q2 does, they take any of the, any of the feedback that we get um, and any of the, the sort of mappable community of interest feedback that we get uh, and we, we put that in there. 
We also are, you know, we get we get emails, all the emailed in comment or written in comment uh, or hand delivered comment is, is emailed to us. And I think so for the community of interest feedback, we use that um, first that's the building blocks for Q2 and the work that they do. We also use that feedback for uh, in our in our mapping. So if we know that we're we're about to edit lines in a, in a neighborhood, we'll ask them to call up that uh, that particular community of interest feedback. Um, and the community of interest is, is not just the geography. I think that that input. Uh, it, it's easy to say how we use that very particular like geographical input, but it also comes with a more well, side that's a little bit harder to quantify and a little bit harder to sort of talk about how we use that. And I think it's I think different members probably have different approaches, but I think um, we, we do appreciate hearing those human stories and those human angles because at the end of the day, we're we're a deliberative body. It's not a, you know it's not a popularity contest, so we're trying to. Get in all the input, take it all in, and, and make it work. Okay, I will roll right through to the third question. Can you describe the process by which the redistricting task force evaluates and establishes priorities for the purpose of drawing maps, and what factors do you consider? Um, that's a good question. Um, so the, uh, the, I think the values and the priorities. Uh, a lot of this is, is we're sort of having as we are deliberating on these maps, um, we, we're having these really serious conversations about this because a lot of these things are are very personal and are are very are very serious. There are, of course, a lot of you know non non personal impersonal guidelines that we have to follow. We have the um, you know we have to be contiguous and compact, and we to keep communities of interest together, and of, of course the, the the deviations. But I think. Um, I think for me, for me personally, I, I, I could, I could talk to my, to my approach, um, and I think everybody else has their own, their own angle to it. But for me, I, you know, I, I work for SFMTA and residential parking policy manager for the city. And for me, when I am hearing community of interest input and I'm hearing this input, I think about people's relationship with city and with city government. And I'm always, when I started, I'm always shocked that, you know, we have a website, we have everything, but so many people that are only way into the tangled mess that is local government is their supervisor's offices. And um, so when we're talking about keeping communities of interest whole, um, which we, we endeavor to do, to me, that's, that's sort of the main reason, because if, if something happens to a community of interest, they're going to want to have a single point of contact and somebody who's, who's paying attention to those problems and those issues. And I think I, the members of the task are discuss in our discussions, it's clear that keeping communities of interest together is uh, is very important and is is important because of that reason because uh, of representation really isn't just about the numbers and isn't just about who is getting elected but it's about how the um, how us as government can hear from the community. Any questions from the commission? Okay. So yeah. So besides. Keeping communities of interest whole, that's the only criteria I've heard, I, I've heard you mention so far. What? Sure. Because they're obviously. They're ob obviously, yes, there are obviously other ones. I think um, the sort of next step beyond that is communities of interest that show an affinity for each other. Um, and we, you know, without getting in, 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 into the, the particular lines, we've heard from a lot of communities that, that have that particular connection to other communities. Um, and, you know, for, for those, it, it's helpful to, when they are able to demonstrate those connections through. Shared services, shared socioeconomic status, um, things like that. So we take those into consideration as well. Um, there's also, you know, there's also non um, sort of non polygonal communities of interest. Technically, a community of interest is, as we sort of define it as a, as a shared split, shared geography. But there's also certain types of assets, certain types of housings that, or certain um, transportation assets that are are shared uh, but are scattered, and we take that into consideration as well. Um, and I think the hard question is, is how you, you balance all of that. And I think that I, I, I can't really give you a form formula for that. And I think it's something that we are having the, as we have the discussions about, everyone is sort of, you know, coming, making, making the case of how they're understanding it and coming to that, that conclusion. So just to follow up, you made a point that certain maps were, you know, non-viable at some point. Um, uh, can you elaborate on what you meant by non-viable? Sure. Um, without, yeah, without um, getting into the specifics of the maps, um, I, I would say, yeah, on, on Monday, we 
we had discussions about um, about 4D, and with that map, a lot of the numbers were were very large um, in a lot of the districts, and a lot of the moves would have involved um, either some of the moves would have involved moving communities of interest um, out of districts where they did not um, they did not did not choose choose to go to, and I think um, we had we were having discussions about how to how to weigh, weigh that um, the way that aspect, but we also had to a lot of the moves would have also involved splitting up communities of interest and we had to have we were had to have conversations about to what extent we want to do that and why and I or, or generally why not right we and I think um, there were many discussions that we had about specifically communities of interest that have um, I, I think that there was a desire in general to not split up communities of interest that was kind of key and it was really hard to make those numbers work without doing that um, within that context and based based on the conversations and based on everything else about what where other districts should where other neighborhoods should go it didn't seem like that was going to, to work out okay thank you so um one of the things that i'm having a hard time understanding is like the the redistricting process isn't a zero-sum game there's like the nature of drawing boundaries is there's a lot of room for compromise mm -hmm. And, but in this case, from the comments we've been hearing, it seems like, you know, 1 group of people is very, um, dissatisfied with, with the, the direction things are going. And so can you explain to me, like, why is it, um, not possible to create a, a map that kind of makes. All sides a little bit unsatisfied instead of it, it appears that 1 side is. Taking the brunt of that, I, I, I would say that, um, that's. To be honest, I think that's the direction we're, we're going in. Um, I think, you know, if you took a snapshot at, at, on Monday night, I, I could see how one would come to that that conclusion. Um, but again, try 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 not get too specific in the lines. But with the maps, with the changes we've made to the maps that we've been working on yesterday or Wednesday and yesterday, um, we've we've definitely gone in a direction where we responded to some to some not all of the complaints of folks who were dissatisfied. By that vote on Monday night, um, we've made we've made some changes to the map that are responded to that, and um, having spent a lot of time with 4D and with that map, and from hearing the from the result of the vote that we had on Monday night on that motion and the discussion that we had on that night based on what types of maps could have gotten five votes, I do I do not think that there was a 4D map that. Could have gotten five votes that will that preserve the things about 4D that that those people um, that the, the people who commented on talked about it. It's it's it, and it's it's going to be a hard conversation, right? Because there is you know, we're talking about communities that that gave you know, really dedicated, passionate input and passionate feedback, but it's also communities with with large numbers that are going to it's going to be hard to fit within the context of everything else in a way that satisfies en enough of the enough of the, the body. So yeah, so I think I, I think the, the pivot gave us an opportunity to talk about, you know, going, going to the other side and talking about kind of how to come come to some sort of conclusion and we're currently in the process of doing that. Yeah, I'm curious about one thing. So I mean you talked about various factors that uh, the members of the task force can considered right um, geographically you want to um, you know make the lines compact and take contiguous uh, you know you define communities of interest that can be defined in a, in a variety of ways um, can you can you give me a sense and, and I'm not sure whether this is quantifiable but um, give, give me a sense of the magnitude of the potential communities of interest that you Take into account, or would have to take into account when drawing, drawing these maps. Yeah, it's. Um, we're, I believe we're definitely over 100, especially when you factor in just the neighborhoods themselves, and um, you factor in um, the cultural districts, uh, green benefit districts, um, community benefit districts, um, and the other. You know, frustration is you have so many. Not frustration because it's a lovely feature of San Francisco, but the other um, difficulty with that is that we have so many overlapping neighborhoods as well. So. Um, 
if, if you you try to you try to split one neighborhood, you try to say this is the line between two neighborhoods. Some people will say no, no, that's that overlaps. So, uh, yeah, it, it's it's a large number, and I think we knew going in, and, and anybody anybody interacting with this process in good faith, I should hope, knew going in that we were not going to be able to keep every single community of interest intact. Uh, just a follow on question is sometimes um, the redistricting value will make a decision that there are certain lines that should not be crossed. And by, you know, literally drawing a line in the sand, it, it makes other possibilities and options, uh, yeah, inachievable, right? Um, so, just to give you a concrete example, when the California Citizens Redistricting Commission was trying to draw the Bay Area, we got very, very strong and firm public input not to cross the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay. okay? And I was part of the team, since I live here, that tried to redraw the Bay Area a million times mm -hmm. to also accommodate the very large South Asian population that is in South Bay and, and East Bay, uh, because they had given very strong testimony that they want to be to, to be kept together. And those were kind of not compatible goals. Mm -hmm. um, however, in our case, we were able to explain this uh, to the public that because of this barrier of not crossing the Golden Gate Bridge, it did not allow us to, to not split them in the smaller versions of the district. So. You only have one version of the district. We were we had to split them in the assembly yeah. and, and some of the other district, but we were able to keep them together in a state senate district, which is a almost a million people. It's very large, bigger than San Francisco. Yeah. Um so do you feel like uh was there some root kind of line in the sand that has caused some of these other options to be non viable because for example, you were saying is some of these communities interests are just too large that so they want to be kept together, but could they be most of them be kept together in one district and most be kept together in another district? I mean, there are, there are ways to. To compromise as. Sure, I, and and yeah, within the framework of, of that map, there definitely were because of where we were with the, um, with the deviation. Within the framework of that map, there were definitely places where there were sort of. Kind of trade off points where you have to sort of decide if. 1 community of interest was going to be split or the other and. Based on the conversation and based on the motion that was made that night, it seemed like that there were. There are a few points where the answer was, was going to be neither and we just were not going to be able to move past that. Um, so that, you know, that was Monday we've, we've had. <laughs> we've had more more discussions and that's changed a little bit um, in, in, in recent days and I think. I think going forward, we're going to continue to, to look at ways to make that work. Um, but it seemed like it seemed based on where we were at that conversation with everything we've explored with that map that night um, that we were not going. We we're definitely we definitely weren't going to get any further on that um, at, at at that time. Uh, I should mention we also had to take a, a recess that night for moving cars for street cleaning, so it was even artificially later than uh, than it could have been. Um, but we weren't going to make it further move that night, and I think I, I really don't know if. You know, based on that conversation, if we just went straight back into it on Wednesday, we would have had. I think we would have just had that same conversation. So, yeah. Okay. Great. Um, water. Oh, please. Uh, for anyone that's watching the WebEx and saw President Bernholz trying to make a comment, she's actually put her hand down. You have answered it. So okay. I'm not ignoring her. <laughs> okay, going to the fourth question. Can you confirm the redistricting task force commitment to and describe some of the actions you have taken for the purpose of reflecting communities of interest within the city and county of San Francisco? And again, if you feel you've answered this. Uh, yeah, I, I can confirm. Yes. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I mentioned the, the redistricting tool and the, sorry, the community of interest tool and the submissions and the work that Q2 has done. To incorporate those and, you know, in our conversations, that's sort of what we're, we're centering on the communities of interest. Um, and I think, um, I think what the sort of the, in the conversations that we're having, yeah, the question. Thankfully, we have, we have the submissions from the public and that's kind of where, where we're, our starting line is, but uh, we, we still have to have discussions because, as I said, not every community of interest can be kept whole and. Which ones we keep whole and which ones we don't are, are, are sort of where that discussion. Happens. 
I have uh, one statement, you know, maybe slash comment, which is that, you know, the, these questions that were presented to you today, uh, you know, these weren't run by the commission before being sent to you and they're, you know, they're suggestive, right? In the sense that sometimes by posing a question, uh, you know, it can appear on the receiving end that someone is, you know, that you've done something wrong. That is not the case. And that's not the role of this commission. The role of this commission is not to substitute our judgment for your judgment. So I don't want you to take anything that is posed of you or the fact that you're here today to suggest that you've done anything wrong. We are agnostic and have to be agnostic as to that. We're not talking about substance. We're talking about procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner John. Uh, well said. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. I uh, appreciate your your thorough responses. In the in the interest of time, uh, I think what we'd like to do, because we are aware of your meeting in in a few minutes. So, Mr. Lee, Ms. Rayner, if you have things to add that are relevant for these, please you know come up and do so, and we'll ask follow up questions. But don't feel the need to reiterate what Mr. Cooper has said. Thank you. So. Thank you, President Bernholtz. Thank you, uh, Vice President Chapel. Thanks uh, a member of the San Francisco Redistricting Task Force. Um, as my fellow member, um, Reno Cooper has said, um, we spent seven months hearing and listening to all the communities in San Francisco in a variety of languages. I happen to be blessed to be able to understand Cantonese and Mandarin. Most of my task, most of my task force members were not. And when I applied for this for, for the task force before this commission, I specifically stated that I want to lift up the voices of of the unvoiced, to lift up those, to empower those who are silent or were silenced. In many ways, they were silenced because of language barriers. They were silenced because no one knew they existed. And I think we, fellow task force members and all task force members, have done a good job in uplifting those voices, bringing them to the fore. We have, we were confronted with a lot of difficult decisions. Uh, Especially since once part of the city was 30% over the mean, and the rest, and, and there was one side of the city that was systemically below the mean. That involves difficult conversations. There is no minimum change when one is that out of spec. Um, and in making those difficult decisions, I want to emphasize that. We did not take those decisions lightly. They were they considered all the input that we have received over days, nights, weeks, and months. That they they called on a lot of them called on their consciences, the con the the principles that we sought to espouse. Because at the end of the day, we had we had legal criteria that we had to meet. And when an unstop unstoppable object is an unstoppable force, I think I mangled that. Um, decisions, hard decisions had to be made. And we often make those decisions with heavy hearts, but we make those in good faith. And we make those in the spirit of, of having a map that the city could either be proud of or that the city could work for, for the next 10 years. We contributed hours and hours and hours of our efforts. Unpaid, we volunteered it because we love the city. Because we because we truly love the communities that I personally do love. 
and that they have joined or, or, definitely, or definitely live in. And so I want to emphasize that, yes, we made very difficult decisions. We made decisions that obviously not everyone liked, but we definitely made, but we definitely strive and we're trying to, to accomplish the task that you, the Elections Commission, have tasked us to do to the best of us. I that we can stay. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, um, Any questions? Yes, um, Mr. Lee, I think we were supposed to be on a panel together yes. to finally meet you. And thank you for your service. I uh, appreciate the hours that you and the redistricting task force members have put for this task. Um, I am also used to having tomatoes thrown at me. I know that you're not going to make everyone happy. I, I hear the passion in your voice and I appreciate that. Um, what we heard. Up, please. It's very difficult. Sure. sure. All of you. Okay, we'll do, we'll do our best. Um, so, so what we heard, um, both from members of the public, as well as, um, League of women voters and ACLU, the watchdog groups, they also stocked us at the state level. I have a lot of respect for those organizations. Um, there was a concern expressed that. Affluent communities were being prioritized over more vulnerable uh, and uh, working class communities, immigrant communities. You know, again, I, I know the impossibility of making everyone happy. I know that you probably need to move people around who may have an emotional attachment to their district number. But the question is, can you can you speak to the concerns that we heard expressed? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, yes, I can speak to those concerns. Um, before I answer the question substantively, I want to preface it with where I come from. I come from Visitation Valley. No one has, no one assumes that Visitation Visitation Valley is an affluent community. I grew up working class, and so I innately understand what it's like to grow up in that environment, in a marginalized community. And it's, and to an extent, it is painful to have a have life experience ignored and say, and have an appellation unfairly attached. But I guess politics is politics. To answer your substantive question, we listen to all of the communities, especially those who are marginalized, especially because um, a lot. And I also want to emphasize, we also listen to those who have not, never even spoken up before, because part of my, one of my principles going into this process was uplifting those who are voiceless, right? And some of those voices, a lot, all those voiceless are marginalized communities. And I think we all the task force members have definitely spent have definitely considered all that input. They might not be the leftists. Um, but we have definitely we have definitely incorporated that input in the map that we're making. I do not personally believe that we have prioritized. Um, I definitely believe that we have prioritized marginalized communities. In, in, a, in a way that makes the map work. We have not disregarded their input. We have not disregarded the importance of their participation. We have not disregarded the substance of the message. Uh, President Bernholtz has a question. So yes. I believe she's on that screen. <laughs> thank you, uh, Vice President Chapel. Thank you, Mr. Lee, and thank you, Mr. Cooper. Uh, Two questions uh, following up on uh, both uh, speakers' comments. Um, Mr. Lee, was there any, uh, Mr. Cooper gave us a very thorough description of the timeline. Um, in your experience, was there anything that you wanted to add or edit or anything unusual that uh, in your mind between the, the meeting on Saturday and the decision on Monday um, and basically commenting on uh, what Mr. Cooper was a uh, so well able to 
reproduce from memory. And then my other question is a general question uh, for the task force members, which is if the consulting firms or the task force staff is um, keeping quantitative uh, track of the uh, testimonies that are given and the communities of interest that are speaking to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, President Bernholtz. Uh, to, to your first question, uh, I think my fellow task force member, uh, Member Cooper, uh, has laid it all out, um, the, the full timeline, and I, I have no further additions to that. Uh, can you please repeat your second question? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, the second question was whether there's a process in place at the task force, either through the consulting firms or task force staff, that's keeping quantitative track of the testimonies and numbers of speakers and positions and things like that. How How is that community of interest input being tracked over time? So we, we do have um, a, a table of all the communities of interest that, that the public has submitted. We have uh, a, tape, uh, a near table of all, all the maps that have been submitted. Um, we, we, we have been receiving thousands and thousands of thousands of emails. I, I think I received 200 yesterday alone. Um, but I also want to address the part where um, you said quantitative. I think it's also important to emphasize the qualitative aspects of, of those messages. Um, both, it, it's a both and, right? It's not an either or, it's a both and. And, um, I, I think reducing them to just oh just another tally mark is not is not the way to is not was not certainly not my way of engaging in the redistricting process. But yes, it does lend a heavier impact on a voice for a certain opinion. But it also has to make the map at the end of the day is a holistic process. Right? It's, it's a whole. It, 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 we have to look at the totality of the circumstances, and we have to make it work. Um, and so that that is certainly my approach. I cannot speak for other members of course. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from Mr. Lee? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, President Brookholz and um, the entire commission. Um, thank you for letting us speak. I won't get into some of the specifics and I try not to repeat some of the things that um, our, my fellow members have said. I, I'd rather focus a little bit on some of the things that maybe are more process oriented that will help you get a sense of both the timeline as to how we got here and how we handle some of these things that we've been talking about. But first, before um, I go there. If you would permit me, I would like to say something about my fellow um, members in general. Both members, Lee and Cooper, are two, are two of the most dedicated, intelligent, and thoughtful individuals I've had the pleasure of working with. They're young, passionate, and very committed. I have become a bit of a mother hen to them and coaching them both personally and professionally. When I was in business, I looked for people who were coachable. Sure, they had to have qualifications, but coachability was the most important thing for me. These two young, outstanding men are not only coachable, but they're respectful. They respect the wisdom of others. They listen to the input of others, and they learn very quickly. To accuse them of not listening and not caring is hurtful and I wonder if they've been listening to them, if people have been listening to them. Because as Member Lee said, we have spent hours and hours talking to people. I'll also try to address some aspects of the complaints against us. Please remember that this task force started in the middle of a pandemic. We have had to do most of our work remotely. In fact, it's only been in the last few weeks that we have even been able to see each other in person. Yet we've developed terrific rapport, and I think we work very well together. Having to work remotely was a great disadvantage, but the, the clerk of the, uh, and her staff have been astounding. 
They have been just fantastic and the support that they have done have made our jobs much easier. They are truly impressive. But we did not take our responsibilities lightly. lightly. We didn't select our outreach consultants. So as far as talking about the outreach process, let me address that process. Working with the amazing folks from the clerk's office, we developed a best process, a best practices process that we were able to do under the circumstances. And we documented that because we were aware that all the problems that we were running into, other people would run into. So we uh, documented it for future. I read every minute of the last task force that met in 2010-12 and I looked at the things that they had done, things that applied to us, and I sort of became like the operations person for the task force, trying to organize some processes and procedures so that we had something that we can grip onto. Um, we not only supplemented the consultants' work, but we created a process of reporting to hold them accountable, provided presentations, the six key points of redistricting. Every single, every single session that we had Mr. Kaysel Lee was the one who was responsible for um, providing. Actually, that was uh, that was someone else. But we um, we had presentations that um, two of the task force members were responsible for presenting. And before every single meeting, we would go through what is redistricting, why is it important, what is your role, what are the things that we want you to help us to understand. Tell us some, how do you tell us about what a COI is. And we went through all of that to, to have some sort of a parameter around all the distributions and all the things that we were going to be happening. Um, so at, we, we provided these presentations at each meeting to the public and we specifically said over and over again, we don't want to know who your supervisor is. We don't want to talk politics. Political implications are, have nothing to do with our job. We supplemented where we could, in fact, Member Cooper personally went out and hung flyers on poles all around this country, the state, uh, around the city, telling people of when the meetings were and what they needed to do to come there. Um, we did not take our responsibility lightly. We recommend that the process of selection of the outreach consultant be reworked, and we intend to make some significant recommendations to that effect in our final report. The mapping tool. The mapping tool is not designed for the public. It's quite sophisticated and it has so much data behind it that any change you make takes a lot of work to, to bring the results and you have to know how to process it. It's not designed for cell phones, that's for sure. But a lot of people were trying to do create maps on their cell phones. So we saw the problems there. It's a geeky tool and nobody's going to spend money on a tool that's only used once every 10 years to make it user friendly. So we have to figure out how to deal with that. However, myself, member Castillon and member Cooper worked with the outreach consultants and developed an upfront training program for the, um, the public so that we could teach them how to use the tool. That program is online. We were hoping to go out to the community and do training, but we really didn't have the capacity and we didn't have the staff. We didn't have the money. And that's also something that will be in the final report as a recommendation for the future. Um, it was a good idea also, but we also couldn't go out to the public most of the time because of the pandemic, just as we were about to go out and, and do some of the training, the Omicron hit and we got shut down again. So I just want to really emphasize one more time, we did not take our responsibility lightly and we'll make some recommendations. The other thing is that we have not been listening to the marginalized, disadvantaged, and vulnerable communities in San Francisco. Nothing could be further from the truth. I'm not sure what that is based on. We get so many, you've heard about all the submissions we get. We've tried really hard, we worked really hard to make sure that everybody understood what we needed for those submissions so that we could, they could help us. After we got, got to the outreach portion, what you call the outreach portion. And I want to stop right there. One of the things that we were told is that we needed to make sure that every district had their, had their opportunity to speak. We thought that district six, which was the most complicated district that was over 
um, the numbers so significantly deserve multiple tries at the apple. So we told them over and over again to try to get them to um, get ready for this. So part of the schedule was also scheduling all these districts to come in and speak to us individually. So the outreach included specific district specific outreach as well as general outreach. So it's not unusual for us on a given day to get hundreds of emails with all sorts of submissions. Some of them, because people go out and they, they, they help, you know, um, bring the community together. We get the same thing over and over again sometimes. So we have to parse through all of this. It's really hard when you're working a full time job. You're on the commission and you're getting all of this information in the middle of a pandemic. To do all this, but we've managed, I think we've done a good job. However, sometimes we were there because there was so much public comment 5 or 6 hours, 4, four hours, 3 hours of public comment. Sometimes we were there till late at night. Garages close at different times. Street cleaners come at 2 in the morning. I had no idea that the street cleaners come at 2 in the morning. So we'd have to break. Run out at 2 in the morning, move our cars, try to run around the street cleaner and park there. <clears throat> I'm not sure if you know what it feels like to go out at 4 in the morning and walk across the plaza to get to your car at night. It's not pleasant. My that happened to us. I think it was Monday night when we were there. My supervisor heard that I was walking across the plaza by myself Monday night. And she was leaving for holiday. And she said, called me and said, I'm leaving you my parking pass. I want you to park in my parking spot when you come to work. I parked there one day and immediately there was all sorts of, of, of um, notices out there that I was biased. How could I be honest? Because I was parking in my supervisor's parking spot. So it feels really, you know, she was trying to help me, but it feels, you feel a little attacked when those kinds of things happen. And we try not to. We try to be really um, evil and even and level headed about this, but we are trying to do a good job. And it's really tiring when you're getting home at four in the morning and you have a couple of hours of sleep. And then the next day you have to prepare for the next mapping process or the next meeting. So let me address the big kahuna in the room, the big where we supposedly switched at three in the morning after we had all unanimously picked a man. It's been addressed by Mr. Cooper very, very well as to what happened that night. But let me just assure you that that was a consensus, almost a consensus report. We mapped for days before then on consensus. We didn't have to take a vote. We, that's really complicated. That's really hard. As a commission, you know how hard that is to keep consensus going uh, and to keep things moving through consensus. But that night we came up. We came up against an impossibility of numbers. This city is so asymmetrical. This particular mapping process is so much more complicated than any of the ones I've seen before. And, it, and it's really difficult to figure out what communities are going to move. I've sat down with some of the communities and said, okay, tell us instead of telling us that you can't move or you don't want to be separated, which we understand so clearly. Help us figure out how we can make you happy. What will make you happy? And sometimes it's worked. And we've gotten uh, Japantown and, and, and we sat down and they give us a, a, a map that we can live with and it's no problem and we can go uh, with that. We met with some of the other committees. We met with some of the people from Russian Hill. We met with some of the people from um, Anza Vista. We, we try to work with the community to try to help make them whole, but this map is so hard. It's so difficult to make the numbers work because there's 8% less on the western side and 30 some percent and 8 plus percent on the east side. And then in between, there are such difficult areas like the tenderloin in the city and to move people in the communities. The Filipino cultural districts, the leather cultural districts, all of these cultural districts, which we respect and make San Francisco great. But it's really difficult to make the numbers work when nobody wants to move. So that, that's basically what happened that night. We hit a wall. And I'll be honest with you, one of the members said, 
the optics of this is not going to be great. And we said it's more important that we have we can move forward than the optics. Maybe we weren't so smart, and maybe we should have listened to him. He might have had more uh, experience than the rest of us. But we were trying to do the right thing, and we care, and we take our responsibilities uh, really seriously. Um, you know, people all think that that they know how to do this. I mean, it sounds like it's not as complicated as it is. But it isn't complicated and the task force, you know, I, I really, it, I have to say, I had not heard from the ACLU until I saw this memo. If the ACLU had any concerns, we would have had them come and talk to us about what they think is the right thing to do. We would have loved for them to show up and, and help us with that. I would have been very happy to, to make time on our roster for that. We are, we have. We have people who come and talk to us about what it's like to be um, in a certain neighborhood, what certain um, language barriers create, what are the what are some of those items that are difficult for people. There are all sorts of specialists who have come and talked to us. We would always have been happy to hear from them. We have our DCAs that advise us on regularly if we need something, but we are always open to other suggestions. It's this task force is a wonderful group of individuals chosen by a disparate group who has been working amazingly well together. We've developed significant respect for one another and are respectful even when we disagree. We've worked together for seven months without paying many as a second job to do this civic duty. We've missed significant family events. And I, for one, am proud of the work we are doing. This task force should hold our heads high. This work is really, really hard. We don't take our responsibility lightly, and I am happy to answer any questions if you still have some. I think one one point of clarification: the accusations and attacks you're referring to are from members of the public and organizations. I understand that. Understood. I do. I do, and we get them too. I I don't think you've heard anything that we haven't heard. We hear them regularly, nightly. They talk to us about it, and and we and we hear them when we hear. Them. This is our, our schedule. And it was a very difficult schedule to set up. So the question that you had about why it took so long to get to the mapping, because we wanted to go through the public, then the public wanted a second meeting. So some areas we doubled up. You know how complicated it is to get meetings scheduled. So to have all these on the schedule and move the schedules around took a while. Especially since we had no process, no procedures, no, 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 nothing to, to go off of. So we used YouTube to learn how to line draw. So thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you for your service as well. <laughs> and I appreciate that uh, this is a difficult job. Okay. Uh, and and uh, it, the time gets crunched the closer you get to the deadline. No question. Tomorrow. Again, I'm 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 curious uh, from your perspective. Um, you know what was behind the letter from the League of Women Voters, because, like I said, the league is famously nonpartisan. They have been observers of all the redistricting processes. It's very unusual for them to write a letter like that. And I'd be very curious about your perspective on what prompted that letter. Um, like I said, it's highly unusual. Do I consider myself under oath? <laughs> um, we've heard from the League of Women Voters every night. There is, I don't think there's a night that we have had. And sometimes multiple times a night. And so we, we hear them, we've heard them. And I, like you, have always thought of the women, the League of Women Voters as very nonpartisan. I'm not sure after this experience I feel the same. And I don't know what prompted them to do it because we have listened to them, we have talked to them, we have opened our doors to them. So maybe you should ask them. We will. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question. Okay. <laughs> um, the other uh, question I have is regarding you. You, you talked about the the, the outreach phase, mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like you did it by district. 
and there's nothing that I could read in the city charter that says anything about the task force being required to preserve existing districts. That's usually right. What what bakes in gerrymandering, right? So um, I'm curious why the task force decided to approach a, a district kind of focused. I mean, that seems like it, it's underlying uh, yeah. in your decision making. That's exactly what the last task force did. And their recommendation was that we um, go through the districts and um, I don't know if they recommended that we use certain ones that were more complicated. I don't know if they had as, as difficult a numbers issue, but that's what they did. And it seemed to work really well. They were able to go out to the community. The community actually demanded it. The community not only demanded, they were very upset when we couldn't go out. They had recommendations for us, which places we should go to, to be present. And we wanted to be uh, present with the community. Um, the, the understanding was that we would talk to each district. They would tell us what was special about their districts, what their communities of interest were, what they were interested in preserving. And we would get to know each district more personally in terms of not only their communities, but the things that make the districts special. And so we wanted each one of them to come and do those presentations to us. And that. Uh, President Burns Holtz has a question for you. So to the yes, screen. Uh, Ms. Rayner, thank you for your service. Um, I'm quite struck by your comment just now about the letter from the League of Women Voters. Um, and I guess uh, this is a question to you, but if either of the other two task force members wants to respond, I'm interested in their responses as well, which is to say, given the concerns expressed by many people, as well as um, the well-respected independent watchdog groups, are there, uh, are, is it your position that there's no validity to their concerns? Or are there things you or your colleagues feel like the task force um, could learn from what's being uh, expressed or maybe being expressed by others um, as you hit this final week of your work? Or are you dismissing their concerns as, as inappropriate? Um, I'm not dismissing their concerns. I'm saying that we've heard them, we've talked to them before. They've been at all of our meetings. They sent us letters. We've worked with them in the beginning. They were very complimentary because I was working really hard to try to get processes and dates done. And they were driving us very hard to try to get some dates on the calendar. And they were driving us very hard on the meetings. They had comments every single meeting that we had on the district meetings, things that we were doing. and. We, we were very happy to hear those comments and many of them we took, we acted on. But after, you know, after all, we are the task force and the tool is the tool. And the fact that it wasn't that easy to work with and the community had a struggle with that. That was something that the, the link struggled with too. And there are lots of things that we agreed on, but there wasn't much that I, we could do and we had to keep moving forward. So we heard the comments. We tried to act wherever we could on those comments, especially if we felt that they were uh, something that we could do. But we, I'm surprised at the letter because I thought that we listened, we did what we the best we could. And I think the task force has been working very, very hard. There are lots of people who feel that we're not listening to them, but that's because we can't do everything that they want. And I know that people are going to be unhappy. And, you know, in the beginning, somebody said, if you make everybody unhappy, you know, you're doing a good job. I'm not so sure that I'm going to take that to heart and, and feel good about that because we're trying to do the best that we can. I have a question. She should have Sure. Thank, yeah, thank you. Um, and yeah, I think the, the a lot of the concerns from League of Women Voters, ACLU, and a lot of these groups, there there's definitely some, as as Vice Chair Reiner mentioned, a lot a lot of things on the on the in, the outreach that 
that could have been smoothed over and, and, and helped out with. And I think if we'd gotten this letter in a different context, I think it would have been uh, a little bit better received. But I think, you know, with his, the letter was received within the context of, of this hearing and this was in the context of why we were having this hearing. And I think, I think at some point we have to be honest about that. And I think, uh, you know, it, we, we've done as much as we can with, with outreach. And I really do, as I mentioned, earnestly believe that we've done as much as we can with those maps. And I will say that, yes, from, from voices that are representing certain marginalized communities, the map that we switched to was is worse than the map that we started from based on the way they were then. But again, as I said, we're addressing those changes and it was a, an iterative process. And I think for me, you know, I've been as open as I can be about my thoughts on this process, taken just about every meeting from any community uh, member who wants to talk with me. And, you know, the thing with the meeting on, on Monday, we, we knew as, as Vice Chair Hunter said that that last vote it's going to be controversial. We were going to hear from people. And I, I took a meeting that next day with members of the community who were disappointed with that outcome. That Tuesday was our only day off this week. <laughs> and disappointed with the outcome of that previous day's meeting. And I, it was an hour long meeting over an hour, listening to specific concerns. A lot of that was really productive, really good conversations, trying to move us forward. We met for over an hour. And it was, it was really a lot of the comments that I heard really affected me and affected the, the, the direction that we were moving the next few days. So when one of the organizers of that meeting, just 24 hours later, came into our hearing room to gleefully celebrate the creation of this hearing for the purpose of removing us from that task force, that was an absolute gut punch. It was so harmful because of all of the time and energy and emotional capacity we've given up to this task force, to this effort. And honestly, seeing somebody who I have I've met with multiple times and seeing groups that I've met with multiple times in good faith and to listen to and hurt out, seeing somebody representing from that come in and use, and the next day use this as an opportunity to try to remove us from the task force. It shook my faith in the fellow humans so much. Uh, and it really, it really harmed me in my, my drive for public service. You know, I, I have a lot of faith in faith in the fellow human. That's why I've always worked in government, always probably always will work in government. And it's because I think we're all in this together and we're all trying to do our best with what we have uh, and what we're working with. And it really was disappointing to see that someone took that, you know, took, took my time, took that opportunity to have these honest discussions and, and decided that the, the best way to move forward was to just, just try to do something like this. So I appreciate I hope you do not take this the personally, obviously, Elections Commission. I appreciate your questions and your, your candor, but I think we, we do need to talk about the, that context. I think that was important. President Bernholtz, do you have any follow up from that? Yeah, I, I want to thank uh, whoever just spoke. I can't see you and I'm not it's good at Cooper, distinguishing the voices. Mr. Cooper, thank you um, for that I, I do want to um, acknowledge that for the Elections Committee, which is itself an independent body, to get these letters and um, the uh, outpouring of concern uh, over the course of this week from uh, uh, on many, many um, opinions about the work of the task force strikes me as an extreme um, an unusual, and I hope not to be repeated, um, event because your the ex very existence of an independent elections commission and an independent task force is to let you do your work. Um, so I want to thank you for that. Um, I want to thank you for your work um, and uh, appreciate the insights from all three of your of of, of the task force members about. Okay the um, previous interactions with those, uh, the groups who have written to us and, and uh, who uh, have been expressing their concerns about process. Um, it's unfortunate that um, there's such a sense of, um, there's so many process concerns because I think, I, I, I'm sure all nine members of the task force took on their roles knowing full well that they would make, uh, they would win no popularity contests um, by serving in the role that you're serving in. 
Um, so the outreach both to the independent elections commission about the independent task force um, is is serious and um, our interest in hearing directly from you three and uh, regarding this is um, is helpful. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I just want to say that I actually had to um, hold back Mr. Cooper. He was so upset. He was ready to leave San Francisco. He was really, really hurt and he and the process we have worked so hard. We have worked really hard in an environment where there was no process to create a process. And I believe we have created a process and I could show you, I could send you, I can send you procedures. I could send you documentation. I could send you that. Um, so it was really surprising to us. So. I think Ms. Rayner, you had a couple other questions and. Mr. Lee, maybe we can get back to you when those questions are answered. Thank you. Are we okay? Yeah. We have more questions for you. Yeah, yeah Robin. Yeah, I, I have a question, uh, Ms. Rayner. So, uh, this uh, this morning, I read a San Francisco uh, on a, a publication, San Francisco Standard, a um, an article, and in that, can someone close the door, please? Yeah, you can open it after. So, um, I, I read uh, a piece in the San Francisco standard, uh, this morning, um, there was an article and in it, there was, uh, the, it looks like a photograph of elections commission talking points. Um, and presumably these were the talking points uh, provided to some of the commenters, which, which is fine. That's they have first amendment right to engage in that activity. I'm not condemning that at all. Um, but I do recall one of the commenters uh, suggesting, and I think they were referencing a comment that you made uh, and it's, it's quoted here in the talking points and I'll just read from it because I don't have the minutes from the last meeting uh, is that one of your appointees. And again, I, I think they're referencing you. Uh, actually said, I resent pulling out the names, uh, you know, quote, vulnerable community to get things moving on a map. Uh, is, is that something that you said? And uh, can you please explain? Actually, it's not something I said. I don't recognize that quote and I actually don't recognize it from anyone from the task force. So I really don't recognize that. Quote. Can you say it again? Yeah, the quote is. I resent pulling out the name vulnerable community to get things moving on a map. No, I don't recall that at all. So I don't recall anyone saying anything like that. So, uh, Ms. Rainer, thank you for being here as well. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, speak a little bit to your um, your political involvement this past year and more recently. Um, I've read in the media some reports that you've been involved in some political campaigns. And I know one of the questions in our application form was to describe your um, electoral engagement. And I'm wondering if um, if these were things that you started after applying or. Um, I, I can't hear you. This word what? Would you like me to start from the beginning? Just, just this last thing. Uh, if, if these are things that you started. Um, where in relation to applying to our commission did you start these additional political activities? Sure. I have always been involved with politics. I am very clear about that fact. I'm an immigrant. I escaped from Hungary as a child and voting is a really important thing to me. To be a citizen is an important thing to me. I actually choked up when we were taking our oath of office and it surprised me. I was so glad that we were virtual and nobody could see me. But it's really important to me to be involved in politics and to to be um, present. Um, currently, um, my only involvement with politics is to help Ukraine, but I have always been involved with politics. I have been, I have not ever held office. I have been invited to be involved in politics on a, a personal level. This is the first time I've ever done it. Um, but I have always been uh, supportive of people whose uh, voices and whose campaigns I thought were valuable. Uh, since I took the job on this task force, I not only have not been involved with any politics, but when there was a request from one of the supervisors for the task force members phone numbers, I gladly gave that phone number and said, I would love to meet with the supervisor after we were done mapping. 
So I'm very, very aware of that responsibility and don't have any interactions. And I'm not involved with any political movements. I will be as soon as I'm done with the task force because that's who I am. Were, were you involved in one of the recall campaigns? No, but I was involved in the signature, the original signature. And I, I heard that that's the only thing about me that I ever hear is that I was one of the original people that signed the recall VA uh, campaign. And I was one of the people, but I have not been involved with the campaign since then. I will once I'm done. Commissioner Shapiro, did you have a question? <clears throat> Yes, hi. I wanted to um, first introduce myself as well to both of you um, as I was not on the commission when you were selected and appointed. Um, thank you for your service and for answering the questions today um, and just the painstaking process that this has um, that this has been. I wanted to just clarify one specific actually a couple of specific points and then respond to the politics component of that. Um, you had referred in one of your comments to my my questions pertaining to the amount of time that it took uh, to present a first iteration of a map. Um, and I want to be clear that the intention, and I, I believe one of my colleagues mentioned this as well, the intention was not to assume anything. It was to provide an opportunity for you and your colleagues to clarify to the public who have questions. Um, and I am sorry that the, this has been hard for you personally. I do think that many people share feelings as well. And that is what we are, we are trying to provide an open forum to have a conversation where you can set the record of your, these questions straight. It is not to interrogate. Um, so I would like to just say that as my own personal opinion, not um, those on the others on the commission. Can you just um, clarify your comment in, as it pertains to the board of supervisors? Um, because you had just said that someone had reached out to you and um, I just wanted to clarify that. And then again, I think just answering the question about any sort of influence um, as it pertains to the 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 night the night in question for lack of a better um words. yes but there have been questions like from the from the like from the public as it pertains to any sort of behavior on that evening and if you could just respond to that for the public yeah i'm not sure what that's referring to i i do want to make something clear the task force made a decision that we would hear from every district before we started mapping so that we could understand their concerns. And so the, the, the dates were driven by the districts and the meeting with the districts. We ended up doubling up some districts and moving some districts up. We actually decided that after we went through each district, when we were gonna go through them the second time because they had requested a second time, we would start mapping first and then while the, while the iteration of those maps were continuing, we would then have the second districts and we doubled up those districts to try to get through them faster. And then after we were finished with the districts, then we went full time into mapping. So that's how the mapping dates were set, was based on that. Um, the, the, the comment about the Board of Supervisors is really simple. This is a supervisorial district <laughs> mapping and I wanted to be an example to the public and, and to myself about the fact that we aren't going to be talking about this with the supervisors. I didn't know, with the exception of my own supervisor, who I've known since she was a legislative aide, where any of the supervisors live. And I'm really happy to keep it that way. We had one person public public comment who told us about one of them. And I actually said, please don't mention those because we don't want to know. We want to be objective when it comes to that. So that was my comment. And some of the supervisors, I think, met, met with some of the, the task force members. And some task force members actually reached out for outreach purposes for support to some of the supervisors. But I did not have that um, op, you know, responsibility, so I didn't have that conflict. Thank you for clarifying. Any other questions? 
No, thank, thank you. So thank you. Thank you, commissioners, for your indulgence. I want to supplement some of my remarks, uh, especially regarding uh, Member Cooper's um, references to how we scheduled these mapping meetings. Many of our task force members uh, strongly believe that we should hear from the community first, that we hear from the communities with uh, regarding their interest, their communities of interest, regarding their priorities without the influence of potential outside influences, such as having a draft map out there. Because and we've definitely heard um, input saying we should put out a draft map early to drive engagement. Personally, I think, I know we are in a social media age, trolling the public for comment is not good public policy. It's definitely not the way to draw on that. And so that's why we took the approach to go through all the communities, all the districts first, hear from them, hear about what their aspirations are, what their goals are, what their communities of interest are, how they can see of themselves before we started drawing them out. So I thought that was, the, that was uh, what I wanted to clarify. And I also want to emphasize, I think, uh, both uh, Vice Chair Reiner and Member Cooper, I mentioned, we're volunteers. We're not sophisticated, polished people that have that political consultants, you know, dressing us and blood. We're, 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 we're just volunteering for a job uh, that we, for a task that we believe very strongly in to make a, to make a, a, a fair and equitable map for San Francisco. I think it, that's something to emphasize for, for us to, for me to, to emphasize we're volunteers, we volunteer hours of their time, um, unpaid, because we love the city and we love our community. Thank you. There's no further questions for the commission. Then thank you to our three appointees. This was so helpful, so informative. We really appreciate you making the time, especially since it's driven your meeting late. We'd like to let you guys leave now so you can start your meeting and then we'll carry on with ours. So we'll take a five minute recess while you guys leave and then we'll come back and thank you. Start the meeting. We're gonna take public we're gonna take public comment after the next section. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Right, everyone, we're gonna get started. I look like you want to talk. Thank you, everyone. We have the same uh, technical issues as before, so uh, to the extent you can keep your voice is down that will help everyone hear us. Uh, that closes the door. All right. So now, now I'm going to open up to commissioner discussion. Um, I don't know, President Bernholtz, do you want to kick us off? Uh, sure. Thank you. Um, I don't, I, so I assume the task force members have left the room. I want to just thank yes. them again. Um, uh normally um i mean now would be the time to make some kind of motion um i want to say that my own position on this whole conversation has been that the purpose and structure of having an independent task force as the purpose and structure of having an independent elections commission is to let the groups do their do their work and while there's um 
I have some concerns about various things that were said within the context of, of what we just heard. Um, I, I believe they probably come down to a difference of opinion. And what um, I heard very clearly from the task force members was uh, differences of opinion or, or what they are dealing with. Um, so I find it, um, I, I think it's quite important to respect the independence of the task force. Um, when we appointed individuals last June, we followed the same process that has been used in the past. All of that information that we used and we had was, is, is available publicly. And I feel like our task was to appoint members and that's the end of our task. And so anything else we might do, including this meeting, but certainly anything else, um, I, I enter into those conversations with, with great concern about respecting the independence of the task force and doing, um, doing as little as possible to interfere with their process. Uh, this is Commissioner Dye. Uh, hearing a little bit of echo. <laughs> I um, also agree that uh, as a strong supporter of independent redistricting, that great deference should be given to a citizen's commission or task force. Um, at the same time, I'm quite concerned about about what was expressed uh, by members of the public and also watchdog organizations um, uh, about uh, issues with the process. Uh, so uh, I'm very interested in hearing from in particular the watchdog organizations before I would be ready to uh, make any kind of motion. I do think that our choices as a commission are to Remove zero, one, or two, or three of the task force members. And I think any of those are possibilities. Uh, like I said, I'd like to I'd like to hear from the league and some of the other folks who wrote letters to us. I will uh, I guess throw my hat in the same camp as President Bernholtz say that while I think this certainly appears to have been a very complicated redistricting process and a complicated redistricting process and did not go smoothly from start to where we are now by any means, I similarly think that what it's coming down to is difference of opinion on choices. And I don't think we're here to litigate their decisions on the task force. And so even though we might disagree with those decisions individually or as a commission, I don't think it is our place to take action based on those disagreements. So I, I think I, I agree with President Bernholtz. I also want to emphasize that the Elections Commission is an independent body that is focused on overseeing the Department of Elections and ensuring free, fair, and functional elections. And we are not a partisan group and we should not be involved in partisan policies. And my concern is that given where we are in the redistricting process, that uh, we could be running afoul of that principle. I, my last comment is that I do want to underscore the importance that the redistricting process is conducted transparently, which I think this meeting has helped quite a bit, and in accordance with the rules that are applicable for the redistricting task force and the San Francisco Charter. So I, I encourage and um, 
I want to emphasize to the task force how important it is to keep those things at its heart as it goes through its final days. Well, I'll, I first want to thank everyone for being here today, and I, I want to thank the people that came. Um, it's, it seems like it's been so long. Um, at our last meeting. Um, so, I was, I should say, I was very heartened to hear uh, Mr. Cooper's remarks that this is still a process that's still going on. They're working to try to, um, you know, they want to accommodate everyone's concerns to the best they can and, and reach a position that is, um, you know, makes as many people as happy as possible. And as far as beyond that, I, I would like to hear from all of you today. Yesterday, we heard from, um, you know, I would say more kind of one side of things. And I think today we're probably going to hear a mix from both sides. So I, I'm looking forward to all of your comments today. And um, I'm sure we'll have more to say after that. So thank you again. I, I, as I said at the, the last meeting, um, And it's important to keep in mind, even we, if we have the power to do something, does not make it wise to do it. It doesn't make it wise. And uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, uh, at two, two meetings ago, I, I or two, the last meeting two days ago, you know, there there were a lot of uh, uh, opinions and uh, uh, you know, legitimate viewpoints expressed and concerns expressed from this commission. Um, you know, my view is. Sort of the same. I have an open mind. Uh, I want to hear from the advocacy organizations that you invited, um, and uh, you know I'll withhold judgment until I hear from from that. Uh, you know the, those groups, and also from public comment. But um, you know, no matter who's in the room, our job is to do the right thing, not the popular thing. And so I, you know, I trust that each of the commissioners have that have that goal in mind. So I'll, I'll withhold judgment. This is Commissioner Shapiro. Um, oh, I keep forgetting this isn't a microphone. Um, I want to echo just the thanks um, to everyone who's participated in this. Um, I will say I've been disheartened by the intensity of the partisanship that has attempted to call out or cause um, more uh, attention around certain areas that perhaps don't take into account the neutral nonpartisan role that the commission plays. Um, I might be new to the commission, but I'm very clear on that. And I value deeply the folks who came to the Wednesday meeting and the folks that are using their First Amendment right to speak up in addition to the folks who are here today. And my question in addition to, or my question following all of the, the comments that we'll hear today um, will just be that it around if this is really the the space where these decisions should be made um, as it pertains to certain groups' concerns around the redistricting decisions. Um, and I don't feel that it would be, I, I feel that it would be um, politically influenced for us to make decisions around something that is supposed to be an independent process. Um, I can't say what decision I would make one way or another, but I just, I feel disappointed in the intense partisanship, the attempted influence in many different directions and the, the language that has been used to describe people. And I just think that we can do better. Um. This is Commissioner Dye. I just wanted to to add one thing, which is the purview of the Elections Commission is to provide oversight to the Department of Elections and ensure 
uh, fair, free, free and functional, free and functional elections, as uh, uh, Vice Chair um, Chappell said. Fair being really a key part of that, and uh, having participated in a redistricting process before, I'm, you know, uh, intimately uh, familiar with the fact that if the map is not fair, the elections will not be fair. Um, and the structure of San Francisco's redistricting task force is that three members are appointed by the mayor, three members are appointed by the board of supervisors. The assumption is that those balance, balance them out and we, the independent nonpartisan elections commission, get the final three. Um, so while I agree, it, we are merely an appointing authority. Um, with it comes the ability to withdraw appointments. If we feel that um, our ultimate mandate, which is fair, free, and functional elections, will not be attained. Um, that is within our purview, I think. Uh, I do think it's a highly unusual action. Uh, it's never been done before. Um, and I just want to acknowledge these are extraordinary circumstances. Uh, and we do not take it lightly that this is literally days before the deadline mandated by the charter. And there's a state mandated deadline as well and it will also screw up director arnes's plans for the june elections because all that redistricting information has to be used by the department of election to re-precinct so um all of those things weigh on me the chair is raising her hand. Yep. president bernholtz thank you commissioner die um very much appreciate the, the circumstances that bring you to the commission <laughs> and that um, bring your expertise. I, I found, uh, and I actually would like to, I, it's not a motion, but second your request to hear from the uh, writers of the letters. I, I do feel um, that free, fair, functional elections absolutely are are what this commission is about and that it begins with, with districting. Um, I may be um, not expert enough on the process um, that's both available to redistricting task forces and that which is being used by this one. So I look forward to hearing from uh, the public and the letter writers regarding procedural or process points or decisions or um, uh, choices that are viewed by those with more experience than I have as problematic or um, perhaps even inappropriate, because uh, otherwise I do um, I am I am most concerned about um, issues raised by my fellow commissioners about uh, partisanship or simply putting a thumb on a scale that um, one way or another that's mostly based in um differences of opinion or preference so i i guess i'm echoing commissioner dye's request to hear from the letter writers if i don't know if they're in the room or online or even available actually i don't know if that was a, a motion or not but uh if it is what i would suggest is uh someone introduced me themselves to me at the break that's uh the president or chair of the redistricting task force uh, who's Delaying his meeting, I would also ask that we we allow comment from from the uh, from the chair. Yeah, I think it, all good comments from my fellow commissioners. We have invited the League of Women Voters, the Asian Americans Advancing Justice, and the ACLU, who were the letter writers we received, to join us. And I think what we would do now is. Um, ask them to each speak, and then we can include the chair of the redistricting task force as well. All right. Should Becca, can you remind them that the meeting started? Sorry, okay. I can't hear you. 
that you mind if I take started that? at the redistricting test? Oh, the one one comment before we get started. The uh, public comment has begun for the redistricting task force. So, to the extent anyone wants to participate in that as well, that is underway. So, that's a broadcast for you all. Hey, great. Good afternoon. My name is Regina Eastloss, and I'm here today representing the ACLU of San Francisco, one of the letter writers. We sent the Elections Commission a letter of support regarding the concerns expressed by the League of Women Voters of San Francisco and Asian Americans Advancing Justice, because we, too, are deeply disturbed by the process we have witnessed during the RTF public sessions. ACLU of San Francisco deeply values community input, and we are troubled by a process that has been cavalier and disrespectful to the community and vulnerable communities of interest that have provided public testimony. Despite the substantial time and effort that they have made to provide input, the task force has diminished their input and has made the mapping process itself difficult by scrapping draft after draft. To be clear, the ACLU does not advocate for any particular version of the map, but the process must respect community input. Incidences such as the 3 a.m. map massacre where a sudden and unexpected change was made by the task force. Excuse me, I'm holding the floor. Made by the task force in a non-public matter, comments by a task force member, and I'm going to read it out directly. On Monday, Vice Chair Rayner voiced her dislike of prioritizing vulnerable communities. Excuse me. saying, I resent pulling out the name vulnerable community to get things moving on the map because that's an area that someone wants to move. I think that there are vulnerable communities and we should be looking at both communities. The point is these kind of comments and actions erode public trust in the redistricting process. Given that there are only two more days, one of which is today happening now, for public commentary to be heard, we urge the elect Elections Commission to have a follow-up meeting after today to make certain that real change and improvement to process are in effect, not merely superficial changes in tone. We thank you for your public service and consideration. I have a question, Ms. Sliss. Yes. Thank you for thank you for your comments. Sure. Um, does ACLU San Francisco support the removal of the election commission's appointees? We don't. Have, that's your jurisdiction, not ours. We wrote to express our concerns about process. What you do is what you do. No, certainly that's within the the yeah. the. Uh, that's within our jurisdiction, but I'm asking you, are you taking a position on that? We had a discussion with our Northern California affiliate about actual removal, so I'm not going to comment on that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for being here and yes. thank you for participating in the conversation. Um, I kind of want to follow up on that question, particularly as it pertains to removal and additional issues with that becoming potentially undemocratic um, in terms of how what a replacement process would even look like and it being so close to the deadline. And so I think the decision of the task force or sorry of the commission in any direction, um, I frankly am not sure it's a win for any of the sides that have expressed concern. Um, I do think that perhaps in conversation around future process and future procedure is also necessary, but I, I, I guess my question to you would be, if you're not gonna take a position, could you speak on the level of whether there is 
concern for democratic principles of removal and replacing in the last few days before. I'm, I'm not going to make a comment on that. I'm sorry, without speaking to my affiliate. I Understood. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So just to clarify, you were saying that you're you were hoping that there could be a second meeting. Yes, that there would be a follow up meeting by this commission um, with the uh, to make sure that real change and improvements to the process are in effect, not merely superficial changes in tone. So commissioners can sound nicer or more conciliatory, but are they really making changes to hear and respect the communities and communities of interest that have been uh, bringing their opinions and comments forward about the mapping process? But when should that be? Um, we, we've got till the 14th. Yeah, that's. That is uh, so just to be clear, is that the position of ACLU San Francisco that this follow up meeting should take place before the 14th? We hope that you'll make a decision about making a meeting happen before the final map to make sure that improvements are made. And that's the position of your organization that it should happen by or before the 14th before the end map is uh, finally presented. So, but what, what does that mean? Does that mean before the 14th? Yes, I think so. What do you think? I mean, honestly, really, you know that the map is done by the 15th. We'd like you to have a check in process to make sure that improvements are being made. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The chair of the Yes. Um, Ms. Isilis, what do improve, meaningful improvements in process look like? So really listening to the, I'm sorry, there's a lot of talk going on here and I'd like a little bit of silence as we gave everybody else respectfully. So in terms of really listening to communities of interest and other vulnerable members, not making comments such as the comment that was made by Vice Chair Reitner on Monday, these are discouraging to public discourse. If you're a person who is participating for the first or second time and you're hearing a task force member make a comment about public commentary or testimony, that's not going to encourage you to participate in the process. And we are concerned about that. Thank you. Thank you. Understood. Do you mind? Understanding the, um, and thank you for clarifying that, yeah. understanding the really tight timeline. Yeah. Um, do you have current recommendations as to what those significant changes? I think we'll just, that's all I can say about this. I'm not an expert on this process. So, yeah. Uh, I have another follow up question. So I know your organization is not taking a position right now with respect to removal. But what factors, if any, should this commission consider uh, on this date uh, with this uh, composition? Uh, hold, hold one second, please. I listen to you. Uh, so uh, what factors should we consider when evaluating a decision on whether we should remove uh, appointed members today? I think I've said three times that that's not in my jurisdiction to speak about. So I'm going to stay with that. Thank you. You you are the body. You are the body. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your service. It's very important. Uh, I believe, Martha, that the representative for the League of Women Voters was going to join uh, via WebEx. Are you able to elevate her to a panelist position? Uh, I think you're talking to me, but I cannot hear you. I'm sorry, but I would need to know her name because it's Allison Go. I forgot. Allison Go. She's on the list.
Hello? She's unmuted. She's unmuted. Great, Hi. Allison. Please feel free to go. Hello. Um, so, okay, I can hear me. I'm just making sure I'm on WebEx. Um, my name is Allison Go. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of San Francisco. To introduce ourselves, we are a volunteer led nonpartisan nonprofit that empowers voters and defends democracy. We do not support or oppose candidates or political parties. We do take positions, however, on issues after extensive study that they align with our mission and our values. In our letter with the Asians Americans Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus, also supported by the ACLU San Francisco, it expresses our deep concerns that the draft supervisor district maps created so far by the redistricting task force fail to adequately reflect the input shared by communities of interest, particularly those made up of the most vulnerable and least represented people in our city. So thank you for calling this meeting and for listening to our concerns. Uh, we would like to remind the task force members appointed by the Elections Commission that they have a duty and an obligation to give due weight to the public input of historically and system systemically marginalized, vulnerable, and disadvantaged communities of interest. And the League calls on a transparent and open government process. And this oversight body here is an essential part of that. It is better to have a thorough, thoughtful process rather than a rushed, emotionally driven one. And to this end, we would prefer to have a late but deliberate map than a rushed one that does not reflect the input of the most vulnerable and least represented communities in San Francisco. Thank you all for your time and really your continued service to our fellow San Franciscans. I have a question for Ms. Go. Uh, Do we know what that noise is in the room? It's the door. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ms. Go, I, I want to express my appreciation uh, to the League of Women Voters for weighing in and for your letter. And, uh, you know, just speaking for myself, I know that I read that letter very carefully as I did the ACLU letter. And thank you for your comments. Um, but I'll ask the same question that I asked to Ms. Islis, which is that are you taking the position as a representative of your organization that the appointed members uh, of the task force, those appointed by our commission should be removed here today. Um, as the appointing body, any actions are yours to decide. We have specifically not prescribed any next steps to the elections commission. Okay, and let me ask one follow up question, which is that uh, I understand you're not taking a position here today that uh, any or all of those appointed members should be removed. Uh, but what factors should we consider? Uh, when weighing whether it's wise for us as a commission to remove any or all of those members today. Similarly to uh, what my colleague at the ACLU has uh, has responded with, uh, that is also not my jurisdiction and definitely something for the election commission to weigh in and for us not to decide what your next steps will be. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. President Bernholtz. Um, thank you, Ms. Go, for your letter and for your service. And for the work of the league, um, my question, like commissioners, Jung is the same. I asked of Ms. Islis, which is you've asked for meaningful change. That would, um, adequately reflect the interests of the most vulnerable. Marginalized and marginalized and disadvantaged communities. From a process standpoint, how would we, as the elections commission know. If the. Task force is 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 doing that, especially between now and whenever the final maps are done. What what in fact what changes are you looking for, and how would we be able to measure progress toward them? Um, similarly, <laughs> I I can't I cannot prescribe what what exactly you should be looking for as the elections commission. We are just speaking up on behalf of the, the populations who have lined up for hours to give public comment throughout the last week and several weeks prior to this moment. Thank you. I, I appreciate it because I, I feel like it's important to just say out loud that 
this is where um, it gets very difficult to distinguish between process and um, and the act of listening. And res there, I mean, there there are clear ways of showing respect, listening, and taking into account the voices of those who are making time to express themselves, um, particularly those from communities uh, who have uh, repeatedly been disenfranchised by this process. I respect that. What I'm struggling to figure out, and perhaps you can help me, is where is the line between recognizing attention and respect and listening and insisting upon changes that um, effectively put us, the elections committee, in the position, in a partisan position. So we are also, as you know, nonpartisan, and we have not endorsed any uh, single map or uh, it, 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 we cannot be the people endorsing maps or drawing the maps. So therefore, we are not able to make these distinctions either for the task force or for the elections commission. Okay, thank you. I've, I, again, I appreciate your time. I, I believe, um, Vice President Chapel, you uh, are, were uh, have the presence of the task force chair with us, and I, I'm eager to hear from him because I imagine he may be asking similar questions. What is going to be um, meaningful change in process that can assuage these concerns? Um, so I'm eager, I'm, eager, I'm eager to hear from him. Thank you, Mrs. Go. Ms. Go. Uh, I have a question, Ms. Go. This is uh, Commissioner Dai. Um, can you give us some examples of uh, how you feel that? Um, oh, be sure. uh, can you give us some examples of, uh, you know, what prompted you to to write this letter? That certainly we know there's been a a lot of public comment before the redistricting task force. Um, the three members. That uh, that our appointees um, told us that they've done their best to hear them. Uh, I guess what we're looking for are some concrete examples of where you feel that input has been disregarded. There was an example given by um, Ms. Islas. Do you have some too? Yeah, um, as a, a, I think somebody called us a government watching group earlier, uh, as a, an organization that focuses on open government and transparency, definitely one of the things we point to was a late night vote reversing a decision um, that, as as many have, have pointed out, happened in the wee hours of the morning. Um, that a lot of it, it, I, I do not think would have been accessible. Apologies, I'm going to interrupt. Can everyone in the room please? Stay quiet. It's obviously very difficult to hear everyone, especially over WebEx. Thank you. Uh, apologies. Continue. So I was I was uh, pointing out the late night vote um, at three in the morning as a tra government transparency and accessibility organization. That is definitely um, a a an example of a place that is not always accessible to members of the public. Um, I think that some of our other colleagues and letter writers, especially from the Asian Law Caucus, uh, may have some other examples, and I expect you'll hear some uh, examples from them later. Um, and um, Did we did we lose you? Martha, can you still hear her? Hi. Oh, sorry. Um, 
we we just we have a lot of concerns about the mapping decisions that may go against legal advice. Um, we we will want to make sure that these maps are legally valid um, for elections in the future. And those are those are some of our concerns. Can can I ask what's the illegality? Ms. Go, are you there? Um, I, I believe that these were some of the opinions that were provided by the city attorney. Um, I, I am I am not a legal counsel, so I will not be pointing out specifics. Um, but uh, these were con some concerns that have been expressed in meetings. R right, but you just said you one of your concerns is that the maps drawn uh abide by the law what what is the specific illegality concern that you have uh we, we we just we just hear the concerns that are being expressed in the meetings by other members so we need to, if we hear concerns that like there are concerns about these these lab maps being illegal being not valid we want to make sure that they are able to be used in the elections and so that is another thing that we have heard in the past do you have anything more specific than that? I do not at this time, and I am, uh, again, not legal counsel, so cannot be more specific around it. There's no further questions, then I think we'll move on to the uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus. Uh, I don't know if we received a response. The representative that well, the representative that uh, wrote the letter is Julia Marks. Martha, do you know if uh, Julia Marks is on the WebEx? Yes. Yes. Okay. Can you elevate her to panelist, please? Julie, the floor is yours. Hi, can you hear me okay? Um, we cannot hear you very well at all. Okay, is this better? Much better. Okay, I had to lean in. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for calling this meeting today and for coming together to take a look at the process issues that have arisen in San Francisco's redistricting process. We at the Asian Law Caucus have been monitoring this process for fairness and to ensure community members, including those who use languages other than English, have a meaningful opportunity to provide input. Indeed, one of the core criteria in redistricting is to respect communities of interest. That can only be achieved by listening to the public and incorporating their feedback into the maps. While we are not calling for the removal of any task force members, we do call on the Election Commission to assess and analyze the process thus far and identify needed improvements. I appreciate your questions so far and understand that you are open to identifying those improvements, which I can speak to in more detail. Um, first, I wanna establish some of the concerns we, we have and what, what's the basis for those concerns. Um, so first is a concern about language access barriers. Uh, for community members with limited English proficiency. This has come up multiple times. For example, at yesterday's hearing, there were live interpreters for just four hours of a nine hour meeting. So there were multiple limited English speaking community members who tried to share their perspectives in Mandarin, Cantonese, and Spanish, but they had no live interpretation support. For quite some time, we've been urging the task force to make sure they have full interpretation of meetings for the duration of the meeting so that all residents can participate equally. This continues to be an issue. We are also concerned about the compressed timeline the redistricting task force chose for themselves and raised this repeatedly throughout the process. The public does need to respond to draft maps and does need time to analyze them. We recognize how challenging redistricting is and have watched it across multiple jurisdictions and we know the mapping takes time. And we urge the 
task force to do as much as they can in the time they have and also see if they can fit some time in by possibly <laughs> scheduling additional meetings next week. Moreover, we are particularly concerned that the task force has not responded adequately to public testimony, especially from marginalized communities of color, LGBTQ plus communities and low income tenants. These communities have turned out in tremendous numbers to provide information about their communities and to provide input on line drawing. Yet the task force has proposed cutting some of the city's most vulnerable communities of interest at multiple stages of map drawing. While not every community of interest can be respected, we understand that redistricting involves trade-offs. It is important that the task force's decisions are not coming at the expense of marginalized communities. We ask the Elections Commission to continue to provide oversight through this hearing and possibly future hearings and to ensure transparency. To reiterate to the task force the importance of listening to public comment and respecting communities of interest, especially marginalized communities, and to call on the task force to be very systematic and clear in how it is hearing and weighing the public comment it is receiving. In the final days of this process, the task force must reorient and recommit itself to respecting community's voices and upholding a fair and transparent process. Thank you very much for your time and your service. Uh, Ms. Marks, I, I have a question. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a longtime supporter of your organization. I support much of what you do, uh, as I do with the other organizations who've written their thoughtful letters. So, uh, deeply appreciate your work. Um, I understand that you're not taking a position with respect to the removal of task force members, uh, but that's what we've been asked here to do. So, I'm I'm asking. But let me ask a two part question. One, you're not taking such a position. Uh, ask if I could ask you why not. Uh, second, um, what factors should this commission consider when weighing whether it is wise for us to exercise that authority here today to remove some or all of the task force members? Yes, thank you for that. And I appreciate your holding this meeting. I'll clarify our letter. Um, was written because we think it's urgent that you all gather and bring some of these issues to light. And so we're very glad that this meeting is happening. And we respect that other folks are in the room with a wide range of perspectives on how you should best proceed. Um, to your question about kind of Asian Law Caucus's rationale, we, we understand it's very important to keep these bodies independent. But we also understand it's important that these bodies are listening to the public and demonstrating to the public that they're hearing the public and being fair and thoughtful in how they're waiting, weighing the trade-offs in this complex mapping process. Um, so it, it is really on you all to look closely at the process that's happened. Is it, is it clear that the task force is listening to the community? Are there things that you could advise the task force do in the next week um, or a bit longer if they do end up missing their deadline to ensure that there is that the public is actually being heard and the public understands that it is being heard because that's important to the democratic process too Th thank you miss marks if i may just one, one more question because you did raise a concern that's a concern of mine as well and i'll ask uh I'll ask the uh, chair to comment on this as well. So you, you've identified language access barriers where live interpreters were made available only four hours on a nine hour meeting and there was no live interpretation support. What, what, what would you ask for from the chair to, uh, to demonstrate his commitment to language access during the remainder of this process? There need to be interpreters available for the duration of the meetings. It's clear that the meetings will be going very long at this stage of the process. I'm not an expert on budgeting, but the budget must be found to support um, full access for all San Franciscans, even those who prefer to speak a language other than English. Thank you. Um, thank you for um, Thank you. I echo what my colleagues have said. I wanted to ask a specific question pertaining to incorporation of public feedback um, because this is, I think, fundamentally the 
challenge that is in front of us is whether the task and the members of the public in the room, please keep it quiet. Otherwise, you'll be asked to leave. Sorry, um, this interpretation for the seniors. I just wanted to voice out this because the meeting is working behind. So some of the seniors are here for room 408 to speak about the redistricting. So, or uh, can they? Can I let them know? The public comment is happening right now. Yes, yes. Please, please, please do. Yes, anyone who would like to do public comment at the redistricting task force, please. Well, she wants to say it in a language that's not English. Oh. <laughs> Why were they in here? What? Why were they in here? Oh. They were gonna give public comment. Okay. I'm gonna continue. Do you mind closing the door? Just thank you. Um, point of order, there has been no translation during all these hours for these monolingual cases at all. Yes, ma'am. Um, three hours sitting here and they don't understand what's yes, happening. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I don't mean to. Because uh, I, I I didn't understand that there wasn't any translation or the monolingual yes. speakers been here for hours. <laughs> I just Deputy thought it was surprising. Deputy City Attorney Flores. Uh, we did not receive any requests for translation services. Uh, so uh, we cannot provide translation services if we do not get a request. Uh, and and we, we receive requests usually by uh, emailing the clerk of the, the, board, the clerk of this commission. Thank you. And and if if I may, we need to continue with this meeting so that everyone that wants to give public comment has an opportunity to give public comment. And so I, I'd ask that. I'd ask everyone in attendance to please uh, keep it down uh, and just respect uh, the commission's time and your time and let's move forward. Thank you and thanks for your patience, Ms. Marks. Um, I wanted to ask to ask about um, the going back to your feedback regarding the public, uh, the public's feedback in the process. Um, that that has been kind of a theme of concern. And so we did hear from the task members this morning as they, as it pertained to how they believe they had incorporated um, the public feedback. And so, and particularly those members who have historically been disenfranchised by this process. And so I wanted to ask your perspective on what would be an adequate um, an adequate system or procedure or explanation or transparency around that, how that is being, the public feedback is being incorporated into the process from your point of view. Yeah, I really appreciate that question. And as I said, we recognize no map meets every single community's needs, but that's why it's so important to make sure when decisions are being made, marginalized communities are being kept in mind and any trade-offs that are being made are being made knowingly um, and clearly so the public can understand why the maps are going the way they are. And we have seen instances where there's been an outpouring of public comment regarding certain communities of interest. For example, um, SOMA and Tenderloin and the close connections across socioeconomic and other policy considerations between those areas or the historic communities between Potrero Hill and the Bayview and where there will be a significant amount of public testimony about those communities and then soon thereafter there will be a mapping decision that does not respect those CLIs and so if there can be a clearer documentation as folks are calling in, what are the public callers saying? Not just about the districts, but the communities too. 
and that can be clearly documented and easy for the public to locate, I think that would give the public more faith in this process. Um, some of that is out there, but it is hard to navigate your table and it, it is hard for the public to understand what are the task force members hearing. And we recognize in an eight hour meeting, it's hard to remember the comment that started four hours ago. So when that is documented in a summary form or format or a written format, it can help make sure there is no recency bias or other things kind of like getting in the way of how the task force is taking in and weighing and considering the vast public comment that they're receiving. So I think documentation is part of it. Um, and then as decisions are being made while mapping, stating out that people recognize what trade-offs are happening and why they're making those choices is, is really important too. Um, and it can lead to richer discussion among task force members, as well as giving the public more confidence in the process. And I don't want to imply that none of this is happening, but I think in light of how many people have gotten involved and how many people are feeling like they are not being heard and their communities are not being respected, it's more important than ever that the task force makes sure it's taking all of those steps um, and being very explicit about the choices it's making and checking with themselves what communities are um, being impacted by this decision we're making. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. I think that's actually an incredibly helpful framework, um, especially it, as we look at it in the context of what we heard earlier today. So thank you, uh, President Bernholtz. You know you have a question. Uh, it's more of a comment, and I, I want to make sure it gets written into our record as well as um, this is. I'm addressing this partly to the chairman who I hope is still with us and I appreciate his time. Thank you very much, Julia, for that, those, those suggestions. I've now hear a, a list of things that strike me as um, doable and meaning, and I hope meaningful based on what we've heard. Um, cert clearly there are certain comments uh, and statements that have been made by individual members of the task force that are inappropriate regarding um, their what sounds like their opinion about certain groups, and I think that needs to to be stopped. Uh, the suggestion just made now builds on the question that was asked of the three task force members. Of course, this doesn't just go to our appointees, but to all the task force members um, regarding whether or not they were tracking the comments from communities of interest and what they were asking for. I understood the answer to that question to be yes. I understand Ms. Marks's comment to be, but it's not useful to the public. And so I think changes to that process so that um, that would be useful to the public are important. I think the document trade documentation of trade-offs being made that one community may be being kept whole, other communities being uh, divided against their wishes, that should be very explicitly um, documented and stated and justifiable uh, given the task force's um, responsibility to free, fair, and functional elections and its attention to issues of equity. Um, finally, I think there was um, uh, the, the, language, the language access and I presume also um, accessibility for people with disabilities. Um, I, it's, I realize it's very late in the process, but those should be fully available for the entire duration of all meetings. If those things are not happening, those can be clearly addressed and seen as um, progress. Um, I may have missed some, but I want to thank uh, Ms. Marks, Ms. Islas, and Ms. Go. Those those are very useful and, and um, clear, and I look forward to hearing uh, more from others. Thank you. As this commissioner die, I think the other one that was really clear was, uh, uh, unfortunately, the task force has um, kind of boxed, its, boxed itself into a corner with the deadline at this point. And so the additional recommendation I heard from Ms. Marks was actually to schedule more meetings. And I'd love to hear from the, the chair on what the possibility of, of that may be. Uh, given that there's very little time left if you're to meet the charter deadline. Uh, and as I understood from um, 
member Cooper that uh, the reason the deadline is now the 9th is because there wasn't a dead. There wasn't a meeting scheduled on the 12th. And so is there, and I'd like to give the chair an opportunity to respond to these specific suggestions. Um, the challenge we face now is that uh, there is live mapping happening and there's live response happening and um, in order to meet the charter deadline, you know, basically everyone's going to have to kind of knuckle down <laughs> and be there in the final stretch uh, because uh, it's possible that you might miss something um, if you're not available. And I know that's that is really inconvenient to the public. That's the reason at the state level we had to release the draft map two months beforehand to give the public plenty of time to analyze and respond to it. And then in fact, we got so much input that we, you know, in our first uh, attempt at this actually had to, had to scrap the second draft map and we got plenty of criticism for that. But the reason was that we wouldn't have had time to incorporate additional feedback. And so we just wanted to be clear that we, we heard everyone in the first round and we were going to do our darndest to incorporate all of that. And so I think that we don't have a lot of flexibility because of the compressed timeline, but if there's an opportunity to schedule more meetings and, and seek the advice of the public uh, on solving the problem, you know, if when we told the South Asian community, we were going to have to split them that we had tried to redraw the Bay area 3 times without crossing the golden gate bridge. And we just could not do it. They were going to get split. They're just too big. And so then we said, where do we split you? We have to split you. Okay. Help us. Um, and then it's a conversation. With the public, it, but, you know, if. If the public doesn't understand what the problem is and that because we're trying to keep this community whole here, it has these repercussions. Then they can't suggest creative solutions. And, um, 1 thing that I heard that was a little concerning is that people are talking in terms of existing districts. And perhaps at the state level, we had the freedom to. Ignore everything that had been done before because everyone knew it was gerrymandered and that actually gave us a ton of freedom to think creatively about how to re refashion the maps in a way that really provides fair and equitable representation for all different kinds of communities that may not resemble what the previous districts look like. And I know there's not a lot of time to do that because there's just not a lot of time left, but there probably still time. To have a conversation with the public uh, about a creative solution that would be acceptable and also meet some of the other trade offs. If, if the public can understand the trade offs, as Ms. Marks pointed out, then they can also be part of the solution and understand the dilemma that the redistricting task force is facing. So, a question to the chair is to about more meetings and more time in the time we have left. So, it's quite a question. My name is Arnold Townsend and I serve as the chair of the redistricting task force. Thank you. Um, we got live map drawing right now. I'll probably testimony. Chair Townsend, before you get started, and I, I we certainly want to hear you. I just want to make sure any other questions for Julia. No, okay, Julia, we're going to. Ex oh, sorry. No, I just wanted to make sure Miss Marks didn't have anything else to say. Julie? No, thank thank you so much. I'll let you get to the other commenters. Okay, thank you. Chair Townsend. Uh, and let me just say, in case you didn't know, I understand where you are and what you're doing. I served on the elections commission for twelve years. For twelve was one of the longest years of my life. <laughs> but, uh, and, and we kept. I served through three mayors, and every new mayor, I would offer my resignation so they could get their own person. They give it back. So finally, uh, uh, Mayor Lee was elected, and they told him, "Well, you have to get somebody." He said, "Who's there now?" He said, "Well, Reverend Townsend." He said, "Oh, well, we keep him." He said, "No, he's turned out. You can't keep him." Thank God. 
<laughs> I liked it for 12 years was long enough. I didn't mind the job because it had to be done. Let me say a couple of things. I, I, I stayed away from my duty to be here because I have an intense desire to defend the three people that were here earlier. There are, there are, there are nine people on this task force. We have not, as people who attend our meetings know, we have not always agreed. I have been amazed at the collegiality and the good humor in which we face our task. We differ, but we make sure that we leave the difference so that if we need to come together on the next issue, we still can. And it just so happens that these are the three of the hardest working people we have. When we talked about, you know, the, the fact that we don't have interpretation all the way through has angered me greatly. And I speak a form of English. But I know, I've, I've been in other countries. I know what it's like not to try to get around. And I can't imagine trying, for example, I got a little limited Spanish. I can't imagine trying to listen to some election stuff with my Spanish and no interpretation. That's not our call. That's the clerk's office. That's the staff's office. People know that. We have outreach consultants that would tell us when they're gonna leave a meeting. I've never had people work for me tell me when they're going home. But that's what we're, that's the gun we're in. There is no redistricting staff after we finish for the next 10 years. There are certainly gonna be some recommendations in our final report on how we think this ought to be conducted to help the next people who are going to do this job. Won't be me. If, if I've outlived most black men in America already. <laughs> I'll be 80 next year. So if I'm still here, I will have greater concerns than the election, though it's important. My concerns will make be making sure I start for the bathroom in time. <laughs> so so I'll, I'll have some other things to worry about. But I want to tell you that there are a couple of things I really want to clear up. The 3 a.m. vote. We did not sneak into City Hall and call a vote at 3 a.m. We called a vote when we finished public testimony. Public testimony. I had some concern in my thinking. I already knew the optics of that. Other members knew. But my dilemma was, I've got a, my next meeting is Wednesday, and it's going to last just as long. So do I wait and do the vote and more talking at the beginning of that meeting and make it even longer? We've agreed to be here. But there are people who are testifying that I know, I know they think I don't care about them and all that. I know they got families to take care of. They got to get kids ready for school and ready for bed and make sure homework is done and get themselves ready. And so, you know, we made a call to do it at 3 in the morning. We didn't sneak in here and call it 3 a.m. meeting. And, and, and then people, people ask what went on in between. I, I know what people believe. You know, there are conspiracy theorists. I'm finding out on both sides of the aisle. We didn't get a call, at least I didn't get a call from the mayor. I didn't get a call from any corporate big wigs. I wish I knew some. Because we got <laughs> no, we got nonprofits and film on need help. I wish I knew some, but I don't. We didn't do that. We didn't meet illegally, either on phone, Zoom, or otherwise. The change that went on. People had their reasons for it. I'm the chair. I don't generate that. But 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 we did it. And we got a map that we were going to work with. And even now I got, uh, cause we were mapping last night. We got out, people were saying, oh, you're so late. And we were rejoicing cause we got out two hours early last night. We, we left at one and we were excited to go home so early. And, 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 but now I get letters. I got letters on my phone right now saying people who didn't like our mouth saying you're getting there. You're getting, which we always knew it was a process that we're going to get there. And we also know, I do not know why, 
we were not constituted until September. We should have been constituted four months before that to really get this done in, in, in the amount of time it took in the way we wanted to take. And, you know, people can argue with the process, but I knew once we started drawing maps that all our conversation would be about the map like it is now. And I wanted to hear about communities. I know people think we heard they ain't gonna do nothing about it. We're not through yet. But I certainly couldn't do nothing about the community if I didn't hear nothing about what they wanted and what they needed and who they were. And we've had fits and sucks. And yes, people may be uh, concerned about somebody said something which was a little misconstrued, but said something about emerging communities they didn't like. Try dealing with a dwindling community that no one either on the commission or in the audience has said hardly anything about. I live, in, I live with and represent and are, am a part of the only community in San Francisco that has lost population. And that's the African American community and no one is interested in doing a thing or saying a word. And when you talked about, and thank you, but when you talked about legality, what they're screaming about is legality because at one of our meetings, I talked too much about black people and they decided that went awry of the Voting Rights Act. And then one of our elected officials said, I said the hell with the law. What I said was in San Francisco, when we decided that gay marriage was, a, uh, the ban on gay marriage was a bad law. We said the hell with the law, and I agreed with that. When we said that turning immigrants into uh, ICE was a bad law, and we decided we we're going to be a sanctuary city, and I support that. And then I got to read on Twitter the next day that I said the hell with the law as though I said the hell with the law. And, and my final thing was, but when it comes to us, African Americans, and we try to make a move, Damn, we'd like to help you. We know you got a prop, but you know, we got that Prop 209. We got provisions in the Voting Rights Act. The law always works against us. And these are quote unquote allies. And we haven't made a move in that direction. You need to get somebody out of American on this commission too, because we are still here. And so, Mike, and so that's why people were saying the only thing they could pick out that may be illegal, I don't know that it is, and what I want to do ain't gonna work anyway. So I don't think it'll be an issue for a lawsuit. They may have other issues, but I don't think that will be. But I'm just trying to tell you that these people, you know what, now you're talking about the translation issue. Kaysa Lee, who sits here, and Miss Lily Holt on our task force, they interpret after the interpreters are gone. That's who, they're, 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 that's not their job. I suggested, only have joked me, that they ought to put them on staff because they're doing the job somebody else ought to be getting paid to do. We, 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 we would, how do you think we feel sitting up talking and knowing there are people listening that can't understand? Them? We would have people there until the final call and pay them overtime. But we don't control the budget. We don't do the hiring. We do none of that. So I think the questions are valid and real important. They're just taking them to the wrong place. And as people who have these conspiracy theories on how we're all caucusing with the mayor or the supervisors and big wheels, like I said, conspiracy runs on both sides of the aisle. And I'm pretty sure if, if this doesn't get some people what they want, you'll hear that I'm molesting children in the basement of a pizza farm in Northern <laughs> Because that's what we've gotten to in this town. I hear people in front of me disagreeing with each other severely, and I'm listening to say, if they had to just talk. I talk to people in this room and outside this room about talking to each other and then come to us. But we've gotten so partisan in San Francisco. It's not Republicans, Democrats, but we don't like each other any better than they like each other. And I've been living in this town 54 years. And the sad part of that is I was an adult when I got here, so I'm real old. I listen, I've been here 54 years. 
And when it comes to dialoguing and talking with each other, we are much worse off, and especially when it comes to talking to my community. So I sympathize with the work. I really, I understand your concern. And when people bring things to us, we're on commissions and boards and task force, we have to, you know, we have to listen and deal with you. But to even consider removing, I can't believe it. And remember this, this has been a newspaper. These three people have to carry this with them the rest of their lives. And no telling when and where and how many times they're going to have to explain it. Just because some folks, see, there's a difference between me listening to you and you not getting your way. I ought to listen, but I ought to make my decisions based on what they put, what my appointing authority put me in there to do. And, you know, I'm going to tell you, people believe what you want to believe. I know a former mayor that I served up who when asked about him telling his commissioners what to do, and in this case, they thought he should have. He said, I wouldn't appoint somebody to a position and insult them by calling them and telling them what to do. Our mayor, at least when it comes to me, is the same way. You appoint reasonably sensible people and they pretty much can do the right thing. I know it's more convenient for people to think I'm a crook than to try to understand me or come talk to me. Mr. Townsend, you know we would like to talk to you. Um, There's a lot of- I, I, You have to be careful with me, I'm a preacher. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sinners. Yeah, th thank you for those comments. I appreciated them very much, Reverend Townsend. Um, uh, I also appreciated the specific comments of the representative from uh, Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus who identified uh, certain specific measures uh, that that organization believes would uh, increase trust in the hard work of your task force. And so I want to ask you specifically on that. Uh, so one with respect to language access, I know you don't control the budget, you don't control the staff, but uh, have you made a specific request uh, uh, have you made a specific request uh, and uh, ca can you commit here today to make a specific request that for the full duration of your remaining meetings that there is live interpretation services? Uh, not we will, I will, but also I have. And we have been get getting translators later in the night, but they're still not going through the end of the meeting, which I want to see and I will request. We also have sporadic we're getting better we because it came up that it doesn't do much good to have the translators who can test the, who can translate when people testify if we don't have the translators all the way through the meeting what are they going to testify about and we're getting some of that now but i i you know i i can't tell you how much i sympathize with that request you got my word that I will continue to press for it. But I want you to know these are not things we have a, 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 a thought and ask about and some of the members and especially people who have relatives that are monolingual and so forth, they've been really upset about it. So, and, and let me add. And, I, and I'm kind of, uh, and we've done some of that publicly. I'm a little sorry that some of the people haven't said to you that they've heard the task force requested, but People do things to bolster their argument, I understand. Let me ask uh, what, one more uh, question and then cede to the rest of um, my colleagues, which is, uh, you know, Ms. Marks uh, also suggested that it would improve confidence in the work of your task force if you were explicit about the trade-offs being made. Uh, and so, in other words, I heard, you know, very clearly that there are over 100 communities of interest and so someone's going to be disappointed. But I don't know how you have a conversation, and maybe you've already done this, but I don't know you ha how you have a conversation if you're not explicit about what you're doing and why. To my knowledge, and I don't know what people do when I'm not with them or around them, but to my knowledge, 
the trade-offs have been made right there, the discussion of what people are doing and why they're doing. I don't know, you know, and, and of course we know it's possible that one or two people talk to each other about where they're going, and there's nothing illegal about that. I think they should make it public. I will bring it up, but I just don't know. I haven't done any, and the one trade I, I want to get, I didn't get, so I don't know, you know. And then to follow up with that, good to see you again, Reverend Jonathan. Um, when, uh, back to, can you schedule more meetings so that it, with the time that's left, so that you can have these conversations so that when people understand the trade-off that you're making is going to, for example, force a split or force this community to be separated from a similar community. I, 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 all I can tell you is I will go back and check without, I don't think we can, but I will go back and check. See, part of the reason for things happening on the 9th is that once we get a final map, we have to have, and though the deadline is the 15th, we have to have a certain day for the map to be made public so people can yeah. look at it before the final deadline and it goes to the uh, Board of Supervisors. It goes to the Board of Supervisors, in my understanding, for form and legality. But I mean, a board, uh, yeah, it goes there for them, but they can't change anything in it. Right. And I know some people will probably go there and ask them to because that's the nature of San Francisco. But uh, uh, but but that I don't think we can for one reason. We've got a meeting today, tomorrow. I think we're off Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. So that's you know there are no more days before the night. And what we can do after the night, because we do have meetings scheduled for the 11th and 13th. I will check and I will let you know in some form or fashion exactly you know, what we can do. Yeah, so we were in the same predicament. Our deadline was August 15th. We actually had to post it 14 days in advance. And so we posted it on August 1st and people were extremely disappointed at our meeting on the 15th that there was nothing we could do with any additional comment at that point. So what I'm asking is before the 12th, which is when you have to post it, yes. you won't be able to do anything after that. I guarantee you, I will ask. Okay. That's all I can do. I will ask as soon as I get back. And and I think it it might be helpful uh, because I've done live mapping before, and you think you've been talking about it, and people should understand the trade offs. That it would be good just as a practice to summarize. We've landed on this district here because. We decided to keep this community whole, this community whole, and unfortunately, it's resulted in a split of X community. You know, and, and I really, and, and, and I know how important people's communities are to them. That's one of the reasons this process is so difficult. You know, y'all know the story of the Timber Moon. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, D6. It's 60 points over, or 30 points over. And in every community, there's been somebody who has, who come to us wanting to stay in six. Yeah. I understand that. We can't do that. Right. So but but nobody comes saying what they could do without. And I understand that. Very little of that. We have we've had a little, thank God. So we have to do something knowing that we're going to anger. I knew when I took this, it would there would be more people probably unhappy than happy. And that the people who were unhappy would be really unhappy. I'm still hoping I don't lose any long time friends, but maybe some short time friends. Yeah, we have time to regather. It's just a suggestion. Anything else? Uh, yep, uh, President Bernholtz. Thank you, Reverend Townsend, both for your service on the task force and prior on the elections commission. And yes, I absolutely agree that this commission uh, needs to better represent the people of San Francisco. Um, and thank you very much to my colleagues, uh, uh, Commissioners Dai and Jung for going through the list of five suggestions and for making your best effort, recognizing there are great limits on you. My question to you is, are there other um, procedural measures or changes 
having sat through all of what you've heard this afternoon that you think would be useful in addressing um, this, co this core issue of public trust in the process uh, that you feel uh, you should and can make in the limited time available to you? I, I, I would, uh... I would like to, I would like it if there are, but I think part of the problem is, is that the distrust was built in mm. just by who's appointing us, the authority mm. that appoint. If you don't like one of them, then you suspect that everyone they appoint is a crook and is in league with them to destroy uh, poor people or whoever you feel you represent. You know, if you don't like the board of supervisors or certain members, if they're involved in appointing, you don't trust that. And if some of them don't like y'all, they don't trust. You know, so I, I think that's part of what we do in this town. And I think it's really tragic because I think it has become far worse than it used to be in terms of, you know, people said who we shouldn't talk to. For example, my door and phone has been open to everyone who wanted to call me, everyone. And I met with a whole lot of people most of them turned out to be really great conversations, and I learned things. One of the things when you've been around a long time, the two people who think they know everything are the very young and very old. So I, I, I really learned some stuff about communities that I didn't even know that I thought communities I thought I knew. So I, but but you know, people don't want to talk to you. There's not much you can tell them about uh, 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 why you think they can trust you. Tell them you know why, why you why I think they can trust you. With the press, yeah. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate those those insights as well. And I think uh, precisely some of what you're saying is uh, feeds into why this was brought to the elections commission. Um, however, uh, so I'm I'm grateful that you will take under um, careful consideration the suggestions that have been made. Um, I, and uh, thank you again for your service and for spending the time with us this afternoon. Further cutting into your limited time. Thank you, and I hear you, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity because I think even this late in the process, there's still a lot of people who probably don't know how we work or why we work, and, and so I appreciate this opportunity. But my real reason uh, for being here was to defend my three colleagues and the amazing work that they have put in, and uh, it would be real hard to do this job without Raynell Cooper because, believe me. He is a great, great, great computer wonk. And you can imagine my age, my phone is a challenge. I got an eight plus because I know how to work it. <laughs> Chair Townsend, I have- I would have to learn. Thank you so much. On that point, I have one more question for you. Logistically, procedurally, what does the task force look like for you in these final days if you lose one, two, or three people? And I'm not talking about projected votes. I'm talking about the process of getting it done. How does losing people impact you? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, if we lose two or three people, we're working with less, we're voting with a different makeup, and depending on what that makeup looks like when those two or three people are gone, there will probably be a move to undo everything that's been done and start all over and try to do that in one day. So, you know, I I, I can't tell you what to, well, I can tell you what you ought to do, but I, I, uh, I can't tell you what to do. You have to make up your own mind, but it's clear to me what you want to do. Because I always thought recall had to do with suspected malfeasance and illegalities. And I know absolutely none of that has occurred. Absolutely. absolutely. And, and, and it doesn't have anything to do with who likes. If it, could, if it mattered on who I liked, who got recall, there's a bunch of people in this town. <laughs> I recall, but they haven't done anything wrong. I just don't like them. Any further questions for Chair Townsend? I got to get back. Thank you all so much. God bless. Again. Yeah. My parents have the seniors. Um, some of them they need to pick up their grandkids after school. Um, so they've been sitting here and they want to some of us have other commitments too. I understand. I understand. So uh, I just want to 
know, check in with you how far out it's a couple of weeks. I think we're going to have a little bit more discussion amongst the commission and then we will move to public comment and we're going to start with public comment for the in person attendees. So I can't project a specific time, but I, I know we are moving in that direction in the next steps. Okay. Just want to get a time frame because um, I understand everyone has have something else. You can to have do. public comment. They make some effort to be here and they want to be represented. And I just want to. How how Understood, and we we want to give a voice to everyone that's here. Reference, public comment, and then discuss. Or do the mics are on. Just FYI, mm -hmm. the mics are on. I prefer to move the public comment. Okay. All right. Uh, the commission has decided that we're going to move to public comment. I do. We are going to. A 10 minute recess. We're going to go. We need, a, we need a break. We're sorry. It's very hot up here. We're going to return at 525 on the dot and we're going to start with public comment. With the people in person. Five twenty five. We're going to get settled. Nope. Uh, thank you everyone for your patience. We are now getting to public comment. Comment. Everyone's going to be limited to two minutes. Uh, and I understand we have a, uh, a member of the public that's requested an accommodation. So we're going to let her go first. Uh, please come to the podium. You have two minutes. Hello, my name is Landon Tonka, District 5. I am a disabled um, renter in San Francisco. I've lived here since 1988, and I'm currently undergoing intense chemotherapy for cancer. But I have to come out to this meeting because I feel that this is so important. Speak, so I'm going to do the best I can. But I was very alarmed to look at the original maps that the RDTF put forward to the public and that uh, when SF Rising had created this unity map, which really, you know, included the population adjustments and didn't fracture the uh, districts very much at all. And the RDTF just flatly denied it and they haven't provided a reason to the public at all. That's an organization that has over 80 community groups that put input into this. And what's deeply concerning to me, and I'm not trying to get into any, like, uh, um, you know, theories about what's going on, but one journalist did a uh, map of the initial map that they created and put it over a map of the progressive voter population in San Francisco. And I submitted that to you in writing earlier this morning so you can see it. But it, if you couldn't have designed a better map to fracture the progressive vote, and the progressive vote is a community of interest in and of itself. That represents people that are, you know, most marginalized, people like renters who really, you know, are having a problem with housing prices. I live in District 5, and some very alarming things are, you know, part of what's going on. And map 4B has a total deviation of only 1.53%, and it but eliminate 57% of the current population of District 5. It's not necessary. Why are they doing it? And they're not explaining why at all. And so it is deeply concerning about what is going on there. And the process should be more transparent to the public. And their reasons for doing certain things should, should be explaining that to the public, especially when people did so much work to put into this unity map. And it does represent so many people. And they just flat out denied it. And then they gave us something that is, you know, a lesser of evils. And people have said, oh, there's overwhelming support for map 4D, but that's because it's only what they would allow us to have. It isn't what people wanted in the first place. And I think that should be noted. Um, as far as the task force goes, um, I personally believe that this whole process should be delayed. Should not try to meet the deadline. <laughs> As a disabled person, a few weeks, you know, to try to educate ourselves on the issues, 
and to try to make accommodations to be part of the conversation and to get involved and to write letters and to be able to come out it is not really doable in such a short time frame. And to have the mapping so close to when the deadline is is really unfair to us. A, a lot of people have, um, you know, registered complaints about that. I forgot to remember. I'm a contributing member of Senior Disability Action. Sure. You're at two minutes. Okay. Thank you for for your work. Next speaker. Good afternoon. I'm Alex Ash. I have appeared before this commission and in here and pre your information as many times about open source code in building machines. But I'm here today as a former city planner. I worked for the city and the port for 30 years. I received multiple awards, actually, local and national level for the work that I did. I've also worked as a grassroots political activist for national issues where I likewise received multiple awards. And just to present my bona fides, I've tried to be impartial in the work I do, and I am a numbers guy. I have been, I was in the room when it happened on Monday night at 3 a.m. I was in the room at 3 a.m. on Wednesday night. I left about midnight last night. I was in the room on the prior Saturday. So I've been following this process very, very carefully. And I know what people have been trying to do. Your members, you can be proud of the people you appoint. They have been listening assiduously to all the public comments. And they have been a force for amity and comity on the task force. They are all working together, having the hard conversations being very respectfully of each other, uh, not even accepting each other's apologies when it does not go their way because they recognize that people have to pursue what is important to them. And a lot of that is listening to people. But there are certain things that they cannot change. The law requires that the population deviations within each district be within certain bounds in order that People's votes are fairly represented, and no one has a huge advantage like Wyoming does over California and the United States Senate. So two minutes are up. Two minutes. Five two minutes. Two minutes. Allowed. Thank you. We can't hear Martha. Please. Hi, my name is Sin Wang. I'm a mom a small business owner and a native San Franciscan out in the Sunset District. I'm here to express my gratitude for the work of the redistricting task, task force and my disappointment that this hearing is even taking place. Democracy is under attack nationwide and it's extraordinarily concerning to see the same extremist and ideologically driven tactics used here to question the motivation of these public servants. I realize you've called this meeting due to letters from watchdog groups. I read those letters carefully. I listened to their testimony today. None of them have called for removal of a single task member. None of them have given a single allegation, let alone a shred of evidence of misconduct rising to the level of removal, other than allegations related to proper listening, hearing, and respecting. The translation issues they mentioned are uh, salient to the entire body of the task force, not to your appointees. And another one mentioned outpouring of comments related to SOMA and Tenderloin, and then actions following by the task force that don't reflect that. We've all heard allegations about impropriety now from certain politically entrenched forces, and it seems some of them some of these so-called watchdog orgs have fallen victim to advocacy by these partisan forces because they all want a map that preserves the status quo. Unfortunately for them, that's neither legal nor tenable given the rebalancing necessitated by major population changes. To the contrary, those of us who have followed the hearings have seen your appointees go above and beyond to make sure public input from communities of interest is meaningfully heard, respected, considered, and deliberated upon. This 11th hour attempt to impugn them and their motivations 
is a shocking attack on our democratic norms. And I think holding this hearing and scheduling a second hearing is given credence to that. Thank you. All right, all right. Can you hear us? Mm -mm. Um, let me call or email, whatever. Hello? Please begin. Hi, thank you. My name is Patrick Wolf. I'm here to support you. I shut it. Don't worry. I'm here to support your appointed redistricting task force members. But more importantly, mm -hmm. I'm here to support our democracy. There is no credible allegation of corruption and malfeasance mm -hmm. against any of these task force thank members. You. After this time, it's playing. Okay. Politicians do not like the results so far of their work. They can't hear me in the uh, in the room when I talk. Pause your time. Please begin. May I begin again? Yes, please do. There is no credible allegation of corruption or malfeasance against any of these task force members. What is happening is plain. Powerful politicians do not like the results so far of their work. They are therefore pressuring you to replace your appointments in the hope of getting the final result that they want. And let's be clear, it's an old political trick to make a stink about a process and then complain that something smells bad. We saw something similar after the 2020 presidential election. And what that demonstrated is that honest, courageous election officials are the backbone of our democracy. If you break, our democracy will be crippled. The health of our democracy requires you to be strong. We all deeply appreciate your efforts to give voice to people's concerns and to seek any feasible improvements in process. But do not allow yourselves to be diverted from that properly narrow goal. It is not your role to substitute your judgment for the judgment of the people you appointed. Act with the integrity your duty requires. Let the redistricting task force members finish their work without manipulation or interfering. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, sorry, if you don't mind, um, we're going to have all the seniors go up right now together and read a joint statement just so that they can get home. In case they've been here for a while, I'm sorry to interrupt the, the regular statement. Is that okay with, yes. with everybody here? Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Come on up, everybody. <laughs> You're going to have translation, right? You're going to translate? Yeah, I'm going to translate. Okay. I'm just going to, like, what he said. Yeah. You can. The first time the seniors were just thinking about safety and that time. So I let them know. They can take You can take your map. Mask off so we can hear you better if you want. Yes. Yes. Let me know when you want to start. Make sure you speak in that mic because the internet people can oh. only hear it on. Okay. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hello. 大家好。My name is uh, 我住在东南区希望这个房屋和房屋可以合在一起我觉得这三位委员是很积极的他们能够多财产多多换我请你们让他们在完成最后两天的工作so, um, so they're raising their hands in echo of what Jackie just spoke. So Jackie said, my name is Jackie. I live in the uh, East West side. Um, I, I hope um, Visitation Valley and Portola can, uh, can combine. And I think uh, the three members of the task force are, have been very um, working hard and should not be replaced. They should remain and stay uh, so they can finish their work in time. Um, so, so uh, he wants uh, everyone here, all the seniors here, they're here to represent, um, you know, to tell you, because most of them are coming from Visitation Valley and Potola Valley, and they were over there in the other meeting. 
um, you know, voicing out. So uh, I appreciate you guys actually having this public uh, uh, public comment time sooner because I, I do hear the concerns of uh, safety and some of them are, you know, have health conditions I cannot sit for a while. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. Here, we'll just wait a minute so you know it's good. Actually, a request to the speakers can you please say your name at the start? It would be helpful. Thank you. Just let me know when you're ready. I think, I think we're good. Let's quiet it down. All right, you can begin. Uh, good evening, Elections Commission. Um, Marie Harabiel here. I'm here to show my solidarity and support for the redistricting task force. There's a couple of key points I want to make. One, I have been at probably 80% of the meetings. I have seen them work collegially and work with all these groups. There was a quote that was attributed to Dick Reiner. I'm not sure if she made that quote or not, but actually when they read it, I, what I understood her to be saying is, I don't want to have to choose among these groups that are both deserving. That's what I heard her say, and that that is very consistent with the way they have presented themselves daily in these meetings. They have listened, they have absorbed, they worked really hard to make 4G work. And it went until, as you know, three in the morning, and they weren't able to make it work. The numbers just didn't work. So I think what happened then, and I'm just going to call a fig a fig, as they say in ancient Greece, that this, some people decided they weren't getting their way. And so they have gone behind the scenes and tried to make you remove validly appointed people for their own political gain. I'm going to read something to you. Disgusted. You used to stand with us before you decided to abandon your district in your first term. Thought that wasn't a betrayal because Honey Mahogany was going to win. Not with these gerrymandered districts you're standing up for. Truly disgusting. Today, a tweet from Hillary Ronan. I think that says it all right there. They are looking to influence and manipulate this group. The three people that you saw come in here today weren't the only people that voted the way that they didn't like, but they're only going after these people because they are trying to manipulate you. They know they can't manipulate the mayor. I'm disappointed that you have allowed this to get to this point. And you violated the Brown Act, by the way. That notice, 24 hours, but incomplete information about how to dial in. So it is a Brown Act violation. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is um, Rebecca Corruption. I am with the uh, Better House Policies. Ask President what time it is. It is time to do the right thing. Commission members, ladies and gentlemen, any attempt to remove any member of the task force would be an egregious violation of democracy. It would, it would lead a blot on this commission's record. We think it was hard, resist the temptation, and do the right thing. Do not remove any member of the task force. Thank you. That's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, listeners. 
And thank you for this hearing. I really appreciate your response to the gravity of the situation. Um, and if you need a, a video date and timestamp for, for what uh, Vice Chair said, I will be glad to provide it. And uh, here's a statement from um, Member Ali. Uh, and like uh, Member Pierce who has her hill to die on, this is my hill to die on because you don't forsake the people who raised you. Now, does that suggest that redistricting goals take priority over his relationships of his upbringing, his family? So I will have three quick buckets if I can. Leadership, transparency, clear decision-making process, prioritizing the vulnerable and the marginalized. Leadership, uh, the vice chair brought up the subject of having simultaneous translation back in January. I don't know what requests were made for money, but we got it a week ago, less than a week ago. So something's wrong with that. And the leadership in the task force relates to having a clear decision-making process. This is, these are the criteria we're going to use, which of course includes the VRA and the city charter, but maybe some other factors too, like what do you do if there's two coys? What do you do if there's a CBD and, and a coy? What do you do if there's three neighborhood or organizations that want to work together a lot? Um, what we have seen is that there's been a lot of cutting and dicing uh, with no discernible reason um, or personal reasons. I believe even the vice chair uh, or the chair said that. We're going two minutes now. So start with D6, get second your expert to the task force. Well, hi again. <laughs> Um, I was here on Wednesday a couple of nights ago, um, and I, I do think it's interesting all the ideas that have grown up about why me and some other folks who were here to actually give public comment at the other meeting came on over to chat with y'all, uh, not instead, in addition. Um, and I think it's really clear to me, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit, Folsom Street, some of y'all have been there. Um, and I, uh, before that, I worked in accountability processes for nonprofits. The accountability and how to hold folks accountable who are appointed and not elected is a really hard thing to access as a member of the public. Um, there's no way for us to know who to ask for that accountability. So I think the focus on those three members was simply because you are right there. And the folks knew that they could come to a public meeting and talk to your body. Um, and they're right, we didn't know how to go talk to the mayor or necessarily who appoints who for the board of supervisors, but we knew that you were here and we knew that you were a um, nonpartisan body. So I think in asking for that kind of accountability from your body, um, folks were looking for some sort of redress when it seems there was none. Um, our district, our cultural district is getting chopped in half if they go with a map that will not just change our power to organize in coalition, but change the way that our everyday culture and interactions work because it'll change our funding, because it'll change our relationships with our, uh, whoever our supervisor is then. And, and I know we've talked a lot about like, is it politics? Is it not politics? All of this is politics. The personal is political. We're living the politics. And if the two groups that are often, the two neighborhoods that are often housing the most marginalized are split apart, we lose a lot. Um, I know there's other stuff with the map. I don't understand all of it, but uh, that part I'm aware of. So thank you for your time. Good afternoon, my name is Joe Santorardi, and I'm currently a D8 resident at 15th and Sanchez. I did through the task force many public meetings, participated in several meetings specifically dedicated to D8's boundaries and communities of interest within D8. But today I'm not here to express whatever disagreements I may have with the task force and its visualizations. Instead, I'm here to ask you to uphold your own oath of office. I would challenge this commission. If you have issues with the task force process, 
Why is it only now that the issues are being raised? And as I understand it, you are charged with oversight. And I would ask that the last minute removal of the task force members not be admission of failure of oversight. As also as I understand it, the members of the appoint the members who appointed the redistricting task force have violated no law, not the city charter, not the Federal Voting Rights Act, and certainly not the Constitution. There is no legitimate cause for the removal. Even guests who invited to speak here today refuse to speak on Ill any illegality. I want to stress, though, no matter the final district boundaries, there will not be unanimity among San Franciscans. There will not be unanimity. And if you're concerned about backlash, surely you must know that any blame you might receive for the districts that are ultimately approved will be muted. But if you take the unprecedented step of removing members of the task force that you appointed, who have upheld their oath and lived up to the, this monumental task, it is you who will bear the blame, not for the district lines they get drawn, but for undermining the San Franciscans' faith in their government. Amidst pay to play scandals, federal investigations, and long standing failures of our public institutions, your action, were you to remove these task force members, serves only to further erode public trust. And I might add, there is no more important institution to maintain public trust than the very institution charged with administering and overseeing our elections. And you may now very well cannibalize public trust from the inside, causing long term damage to the very institution you took an oath of office to protect. I strongly discourage you from removing any of your appointments from the redistricting task force. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Um, my name is Stephen Buss. I'm part of Grow SF, an organization that believes that San Francisco should grow and prosper and be an altogether more welcoming city. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your hard work. The serving on any appointed uh, body is very difficult. You bear the brunt of a lot of criticism and you get very little thanks. So thank you for dedicating your lives to public service and giving your time generously. I'd also like to thank the redistricting task force members for their hard work in uh, dealing with this impossible task. Uh, as has been evidenced, it's impossible to please everyone and all we can do is our best and follow the law. I'd also like to give a special shout out to Supervisor Dean Preston and the League of Pissed Off Voters for showing everyone that they are more interested in partisan interference than protecting democracy. You know, it's their First Amendment right to mobilize their supporters to get in the way and, and tear down the fundamental institutions of our, of our great city. And it's my constitutional right to extend them a hearty fuck you. Um, <laughs> so um, I know that you're going to do the right thing. That was never a question in my mind. You're all people of integrity and the task force is are, it's full of people of integrity as well. So just thank you again for all of your hard work. And I know that you will not violate the spirit of the nonpartisan independent redistricting commission by removing your commissioners. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Alan Burradell. Uh, the I'm a 30 year resident in Castro uh, and commissioner, your comment earlier today, um, you mentioned that there's some things that uh, we have a right to do, but that aren't very wise to do. And I think this is one of them. This is a good example of something that wasn't wise to do. Um, sorry, I'm here today for this because I think it's um, it's a disgrace. It's a very, very much a disgrace. I listened very carefully to, to what the task force member, his name is Lee, Mr. Lee, listened very carefully and I hope you all do because he laid it out perfectly. He said, our primary job is to lift up the voices of those who are unheard. That's what Mr. Lee said, the primary job of the task force is to lift up voices that are, that are unheard. I'll be here today is talking about voices that have been heard. And those voices have been heard and listened to. But when it's not acted on, when they don't get action on what they say, you get a letter. You get an irate letter. The better response to that letter would be that there's a process and you need to obey it. And, uh, and that should have been the end of it. But you entertained that, you had them come, we had this meeting, it's, it's, it's not right. 
there are 875,000 San Franciscans out there that are unheard. And that task force is listening to the unheard or lifting up the voices of the unheard. Maybe you don't see it, but they've been put there for their judgment, for their wisdom, those task force members, and they will make decisions based on what they've heard. This map won't be fair. People won't understand it. I keep hearing that it needs to be fair and understood. It's going to be legal. The map will be legal, but it will be viewed as unfair. Thank you. My name is Martha Conti, and uh, thank you so much for being here and listening. I first wanted to give some context to why I'm here, why I came at 1.30 instead of coming to the redistricting task force meeting that was supposed to start at 3 o'clock that's happening in another room now. Um, I came straight from uh, an organization that is trying to build a network of people to combat the big lie candidates that are running for election administration positions across this country to try to steal the election the way Trump tried to in 2020 and intends fully to try to do again in 2024. And I'm very disappointed that the same thing is happening on the opposite end of the spectrum here, that people are trying to use a political process to take over something that is supposed to be nonpartisan. I appreciate the transparency with which you address their concerns because that will leave them with no more complaints to make. This process, I know some people think it's shameful to have this process, but I think transparency is how you save yourself from those kinds of comments and accusations. I've been on over 15 hours of redistrict, redistricting task force uh, committee calls, uh, commission calls, excuse me, and heard really egregious language and um, accusatory commentary coming from a number of people calling into doubt the good faith and the hard work of those commission members. Um, I think that, that uh, as someone said earlier, the comment made by one of the commission members um, is really probably, since I heard so many of those things, I didn't hear that directly and she didn't own it directly, but um, it's probably to say that uh, people were really um, overstepping their bounds in the things that they were saying, and it's not supposed to be a partisan uh, process. Thank you so much for your comment. Pushing that. Your time is up. Oh, okay. your two minutes. Okay. Stick with what you're doing, please. Have faith. Well, good afternoon, Elections Commission. I'd rather be at the Giants game, but some things are a lot more important than sports, and I can't believe I'm saying that. You know me. I would never say that. <laughs> My name is Madison Tam. I'm here representing the Chinese American Democratic Club, and we're deeply concerned about the events of uh, uh, the Wednesday night meeting that led to this uh, meeting being called. The Elections Commission and the Redistricting Task Force are supposed to be a fair, nonpartisan body, and the consideration of removing the task force members is both unprecedented and it undermines the legitimacy of both your commission and their task force. The task force's job is to draw districts that are compact, contiguous, and consider communities of interest not to consider the specific desires of any politicians or any hyper-political groups. This hyper-political power grabs an insult to the job of the task force, and it ultimately harms the voters of San Francisco, who both your commission and the task force are served with representing and serving. If the commission were to remove the task force, the pressure that has no basis, as we've heard, even the groups that submitted letters did not actively call for you to remove them. This would be irresponsible and a blatant disregard for the many community members that have found this process to be incredibly fair and thorough. So we call on the Elections Commission to maintain all three members, Reiner, Cooper, and Lee, to the redistricting task force. Thank you. Good evening, committee. Uh, my name is Chelsea Waite. I am here to show my solidarity and support to the redistricting task force. These dedicated public servants have been working tirelessly for months to hear from everyday San Franciscans. There's been so much erosion or trust in the public process disintegrated for during the redistricting process. Why are all of us here in support of the task force today? What's discouraging in public discourse is the fact that we have to be here and that none of these so-called watch groups can give us a clear explanation as to this quote unquote illegal mapping that's been going on. And as others have stated, 
The agenda for today's special meeting provided only a vague description of its proposed discussion and action, which violates the Brown Act in the same way that a court found that the Board of Ed's Lowell discussion did last year. To pressure the Elections Commission, which is supposed to be nonpartisan, to recall their appointees just because a group of people are unhappy with the task force members doing their job is a direct violation of the Federal Voting Rights Act. I've been watching this redistricting task force for months. I am continually impressed with their integrity and ability to have thoughtful conversations, especially with the most vulnerable com communities. Your job as the Elections Commission is to be nonpartisan and not bend to political tactics. The Elections Commission spent months electing three qualified candidates with integrity, ethics, and intellect through a grueling application and interview process of a pool of nearly 3,000 applicants. This last minute attempt to derail the task force through unfounded and exaggerated claims completely compromises the integrity of the whole redistricting process, which is supposed to be deliberate and nonpartisan and not last minute and subject to mob rule and intimidation. I yield my time. Thank you. What? Uh, good afternoon, Election Commission. My name is Fritz Chang. I'm a, a longtime tenure resident of the six. Um, I was actually one of the candidates um, that we were looking at during the identification process for the redistricting task force. And I can tell you that I walked away from that process really inspired by the choices that you made. It felt like they were truly the best candidates for the jobs. So I'm here to voice my support for all three of the uh, task force members that you appointed. I personally sat through almost every single mapping meeting during this process. And throughout each of these meetings, all the way up until 3 a.m. in some cases, I have seen members Cooper, Lee, and Rayner demonstrating the utmost respect, objectivity, and integrity. They have spent hundreds, if not thousands, of hours hearing from every single uh, everyday San Franciscans, and even more time working with their fellow task force members to make hard choices in order to comply with federal, state, and local law, all while trying to account for community input. Even when some of the public comment turns highly offensive, aggressive, even downright threatening, these three members continue to listen and show the utmost respect. It is outrageous to me to, for you to consider removing them at the 11th hour just because certain people don't like certain draft maps drawn by the task force during the process. This last minute attempt to derail the task force is completely, completely compromises the integrity of the process, which is supposed to be deliberative and nonpartisan. Your job as election commission is to be nonpartisan and not bend to political tactics and tricks. Please don't discredit the hard work that you all did to appoint your task force members. Please don't do the citizens of San Francisco this huge disservice by interrupting the critical democratic process at the final hour. Please uphold your oath of office and do your part to defend democracy by standing up for the hardworking appointees upholding the independence of the redistricting task force. Thank you for your time. Hello, Election Commission. Thank you so much for letting us speak. Um, my name is Jody Crawford. I'm a native San Franciscan. I've raised my family here. I've lived in the Richmond District for the last 20 years, and um, I really care about this. I'm not used to coming down here and haven't come down. I came down once 20 years ago to speak, and this is the second time that I'm speaking live. Um, and I'm speaking here because I'm kind of surprised actually and came down here to show support for the task force because I love this city and I really respect democracy, but I'm going to leave here feeling so proud of our democracy because of the people that we heard speak about their dedication and passion and caring for all citizens of San Francisco. And I just think it would be incredibly egregious at this point to pull them off. I know that Reverend Townsend said there's a difference between me not listening to you and you not getting your way. How can we say that thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of comments, both online, by phone, by WebEx, and um, in person, are not listening, giving a chance to all constituencies to speak? Please, please keep them in their place. I, I also just want to make one more comment, which is if you were to pull them and this whole process would be thrown into disarray, then are we really, um, as you said, uh, Commissioner, Dai, making sure that this is a fair election because everything will turn into chaos and they're legally bound to get this map done. So thank you.
Hello, my name is Tab Buckner. Um, I think it's important to uh, think about what the task force is for. It's to keep communities of interest together, make adjustments for necessary population changes, and receive input from the community. Well, I'm afraid that I see the task force has gone astray on this. Um, we all understand that we have to give and take in each district, despite the fact that only two districts actually have an increased population. Um, but uh, we have seen draconian butchering around the city where a district like mine five is now chopped into five different pieces. 58% of our, of our current district would, be, would no longer be in five. Um, it means that district two would be across the street from where I live in the panhandle uh, being district two. And I'm sure people in district two don't wanna be in the Haight-Ashbury just as the Haight-Ashbury doesn't wanna be in district two. I understand that these are specifics we don't ask you to take sides on, but the point is there's been a huge amount of liberty um, the, the 11 districts as they are, of course, need to be tweaked on a decade basis, but there's a reason why they exist now because of communities of interest that have been together for a long time. We will give and take, but to just cut in pieces to the point that you don't even recognize particular districts, especially like five that virtually has no change at all anyway, it does not make any sense at all. So that's a process a component that I really ask you to inquire. And I think that's why the civil liberties groups are really on alert about this. So please um, take this into account. Uh, the communities of interest like the Tenderloin and the South and Market that so badly want to stay together and have been the older components of that district for so long, really want to stay together and being the most vulnerable, uh, you know, economically, socially, I think they deserve that special note. And it seems that they've been put on hold once again. There's been constant input from the community on behalf of them and other pieces of the community that still are not being taken into account Thank for. Thank so much for and, your comment. Uh, I appreciate your time answer. being here. Good evening. Uh, it was afternoon when I came here. Uh, my name is Dina Aslani Williams, and I've been here in this room about four times um, in the last since redistricting happened. And before I didn't know anything about redistricting. This is a brand new process to me. And um, when I first came on the first four meetings that we came, I represented my West of Twin Peaks um, uh, Central Council. And I just want to make it clear that today I'm here only as myself. I'm not representing any organization because this thing happened so quickly, we haven't even had a time to meet or get consensus, even have a you know, Zoom meeting. So I'm here representing myself. Um, during this process, I was very impressed about the um, basically the listening, because I've been in this room when the line went out and there was another group there and they listened. People repeated the same thing over and over again and they listened. At no time did I feel that they had taken their attention away or they were dismissive. And that went for everyone across the board. Um, I also uh, didn't feel that, I, I'm, I'm also, so I was impressed with that. I'm also impressed with today's meeting. This actually gives me hope in democracy because I was very dismayed when I thought that you were convening to basically take away your appointments of people that you have vetted and trusted and they're doing a job, which is not done. I, part I saw a couple of mapping sessions. This is a very complicated thing, as you all know. And um, I, so I'm very impressed with this meeting. I'm very impressed with the redistricting uh, uh, task force and everything that they've done, uh, particularly with uh, both the chair and vice chair. And uh, I took what Mr. Jeremy Lee said in the beginning of each meeting and to heart that he talked about making this on my So thank you very much. Appreciate uh, everything. Thank you. Thank you. And please keep them in place. Good evening. My name is Marina Roach and I'm here because um, I'm not a political person at all. This is all very new to me, but I'm here because of a letter that you received from the League of the Women of San Francisco, and I didn't even know who they were, so I looked them up, and it says they're about democracy, empowering voters, defending democracy. Well, democracy is not removing members just because you don't like what they're doing, and they're trying to remove, even though they 
did not come out and say it today. In fact, they couldn't even really tell you what they wanted, but they really want you to remove three members that you chose that went through a process to be picked. And I believe there were like 3,000 applications and you chose them. Um, and then it's like I read Dean Preston's um, Twitter feed on his Twitter feed saying that the commission schedules special meeting this Sunday regarding possible removal of redistricting task force members. That's why we're here, because the likes of Dean Preston want him gone too. And it's really upsetting because I listened to those three members and they are working their asses off to do what you chose them to do. And the fact that they even had to come here in front of this board, this commission, and the people in this room to defend their work is disgraceful. And I really wish, in fact, I was confused when I first came, I'm like, okay, we're here because you're trying to remove them. And then I'm listening to you. I'm like, well, are you really trying to remove them? Um, so I, I really don't know if that's your goal or not, but I would hope that you would keep them. And um, there's nine members on that task force. Not just three. Thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners. My name is John McCormick. I am here this evening um, because I just wanted to point out real fast, the Asian Law Caucus earlier today uh, said that they had deep concerns with the way that public uh, marginalized communities were being represented throughout this process. Um, and that was really interesting to me because we heard earlier from the commissioners that the reason that the vote went so late on Wednesday night was because they wanted to take public comment first, to hear from the public before they actually uh, drew their maps and made their votes. Um, as you know, the uh, the commissioner said that they were keeping track of the tallies of everyone's counts, and uh, so so was everybody else. We were also keeping track. And of the 150 public commenters that evening, 117 of those public commenters asked that Map 4D move forward through the process. Map 4D keeps the marginalized communities in the tenderloin and so much together in District 6. It keeps Potrero Hill in Bayview. Uh, and it takes Seacliff out of the Richmond district, all of which are marginalized communities. These are the communities that um, have great bless you, uh, that have, have of great interest uh, in the in the in San Francisco. And um, yet that evening at 3 a.m., they they switched from map 4D to map 4B, which actually does not represent the needs and interests of those most marginalized. I just want to point that out because. Uh, I think I told you this the other night, like, I, like I hope that this body represents those that uh, are most marginalized and, and um, it sounds like there's some legal concerns about that. Um, and finally, I'd like to just put forward to that after last night, um, they're still not moving forward with maps that reflect the needs of those most marginalized in San Francisco. And I think that that is of grave concern to me after um, spending the last week here that, you know, hundreds of people come out to express their need for the marginalized communities. Um, thank you for your work and thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Hi, commission members. My name is Colleen Rebecca. Um, thank you for hearing my comment a few days ago about my concerns about, um, this process and how the process has, uh, had a dampening effect on democracy, had a dampening effect on um, electoral and civic participation among our most marginalized community members. Um, for almost 20 years, I've worked in the Tenderloin. Um, my job is to help community members to participate in the civic process and also to participate in the electoral process. Um, nonpartisan voter registration, voter information, all that kind of stuff. I've, re I've registered thousands of marginalized homeless, formerly homeless, um, people with histories of mental health, trauma, um, people with extremely low incomes to vote in the Tenderloin. And as I've done that over the 20 years that I've been working, I've talked to people. What is it that, um, what is it that's a barrier for you from voting? And they say, it's because we're poor, or we used to be homeless, or we're currently homeless, or we're, we're eating in a food line, and nobody wants to listen to us. No one takes us seriously, and the process isn't for us. It's for it's for other people. It's not for us. And so, 
help helping people to participate in a process like this and having them not be heard. What I've been hearing consistently from folks in the tenderloin, the lowest income marginalized folks is that we keep saying the same thing and we keep getting told that we're not saying what we're saying, that that's been their process with the task force. And that is very concerning because what people are saying is, what's the point of me showing up at all? What's the point of me voting? What's, I, I never am listened to and I'm not listened to here and I don't trust the process. And that is what the election commission I think is supposed to be looking out for is a fair and democratic process that's accessible to all people, including the lowest income, the homeless people. Thank you so much for your comment, your two minutes are up. So thank you. I, uh, my name is Michael Lovsett, and I, I just want to make one point. I have a background in stats, statistics, and I did employee research and surveys for quite a few years. And um, data that is not representative of the entire population has to be thrown out for whatever reason or wherever, wherever that incompetency occurred. But when uh, Ms. Uh, Bernholz, um was, uh, was asking about keeping quantitative track of district input. That was a question that she asked, but was not answered. Because I listened very carefully to that part, because that's the only thing I know about. And I didn't understand Mr. Lee's answer of emphasizing qualitative data over quantitative data. I'm very familiar with these two things. <laughs> qualitative is you're telling a story. Quantitative is actually representative of everybody. And so that should be a red flag to anybody. And I don't know, I'm not going to make any emotional appeal or any sites, but um, your data is not good. And if there are the, the, the numbers that Ms. Bernholz asked for, I, I think they'd be um, very helpful in deciding how to move forward with this. All right, thank you. Thank you for coming. Hey there. I'm Ramon Iglesias. Um, this process started in June 2021. I know because I was there applying to be part of the task force. The selection process was open, transparent, and the criteria was pretty clear. There was even a spreadsheet where we were, were being ranked on this criteria. This was about 300 days ago. There are only seven days left to finish the redistricting plan. If my fellow citizens have concerns about the process, the criteria, or the members, where have they been these last 300 days? If the outcome is what they don't like, then I'm so sorry about it, but there is a process in place there that we're supposed to follow. We have seven days to, to finish the task force, to the, the redistricting. If we change the members, we will derail the process and we will undermine the trust in these institutions. Commissioners, they are pressuring you to take an unprecedented step that they are not even able to explicitly endorse. Let's focus on getting the job done and stop wasting our time with preposterous and undemocratic sabotage. Reject this removal attempt and let's get back to work. Thank you. Your comment. Hello, members of the Elections Commission. This is the first time for me, never been before the Elections Commission. My name is Bob Akisfandiari. Uh, I am actually, for once, representing myself in my capacity as the president of the United Democratic Club because we co signed a letter uh, along with several other Democratic clubs the Eastern Neighborhoods Democratic Club, the Chinese American Democratic Club, the Alice Katopoulos Democratic Club, and a couple of others. I'll send it to you so you have it for your records. Uh, denouncing this attempt and denouncing what you're considering today. In fact, even denouncing the notion of convening this meeting today, because even convening this meeting is sending a signal, in my mind, that you're willing to entertain undemocratic power grabs and and, and nonsense when someone, look, I, I can't even take the words out of Arnold Towns' mouth. He's Reverend Towns' mouth. He said it better than I could have, which is that you might not like the outcome, but we listen to you. Or actually, you reversed it, but you get my point. Um, and I cannot stop. I was so furious on Wednesday night when I heard that you had decided to agendize this meeting. I walked all the way home from this hall, city hall, all the way to La Playa, where I live, because I just had to vent and vent and vent, and I kept calling people and venting. This reminded me of the nonsense the Republicans pulled with the Stop the Steal stuff this last year, two years ago. 
This reminds me of when you don't like the outcome of an election, you just go after the Secretary of State and you demand them to invalidate the results. I'm not saying I know what the right maps should be. I, I'm not here to talk about maps. I'm here to talk about the fact that my friend Ramon just said there was a process, a well thought out process for applications. I was asked to apply and I said, hell no, I don't want everyone hating me. But these people apparently wanted to be hated by a lot of people because they have an impossible math problem in front of them. And I don't envy them. But I'm telling you right now, if you go through with even considering removing any of these people, you are sending a strong signal that this city does not value expertise. The city does not want qualified appointees because they only care about getting their way. And if you deliver on this, you're setting yourself up and you're setting everyone else up. Thank you so much. Gotta go. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Mike Chen speaking as myself. Uh, I am not a lawyer, but I'm playing one for public comment. Uh, you have received a letter from Jesse Minardi addressing Brown Act concerns about the uh, item that has been agendized before you today. Uh, a brief refresher, the Brown Act requires a brief description, uh, clearly specifying the actions that could, that could be taken in the scope uh, at a meeting. Uh, what uh, the public and across multiple uh, judicial rulings have said that the public should not need to guess at what the body is will, will think, consider doing, or maybe taking action on. And so I'm here to to bring up legal concerns about about what the body may or may not do or discuss in the future about about the removal of members because the removal of members is nowhere discussing the agenda. The only way that we knew we knew was from if you were at the meeting on Wednesday or if you saw the many articles that were published about that. It is no it is nowhere discussing the agenda about the removal of members. Uh, I also have a second uh, process question about uh, proper notice. Uh, the first agenda that came up for this meeting 24 hours ago did not have a proper dialing code for uh, for the for the public meeting, which would in which would unfairly uh, stop people from being able to call and give public comment to this meeting. Uh, and so that may also be another process uh, open meeting issue that may prevent the body from, pre from taking action at this meeting. Thank you. Good evening, uh, commissioners. My name is Emily Lee. I'm the director of San Francisco Rising, um, and we are a alliance of organizations, community organizations um, made up of low income communities of color, um, Latinx, Filipino, Chinese, um, and Black um, grassroots organizations across San Francisco. And we've actually been involved with redistricting um, since last June when outreach the applications and the appointment process began. Um, and you know, we're not here because we think this is so fun and we want to be in another hearing. And you know, like it's actually because there were serious concerns, and we were hoping that the election commission would look into them. And I think you all have done that today. I think you've asked very thoughtful questions. Um, you know, I think the ACLU and the League of Women Voters and Asian Law Caucus also gave some very good and compelling examples of their concerns. Um, so it's not about personal attacks on the task force members. It's really about, you know, are we ensuring that this process, which impacts the city for 10 years, um, is given the due weight and the due consideration for public input? And I feel that you all have asked um, really good questions to the task force members as well. And so we appreciate you all taking this seriously, actually, because there are serious concerns. Um, and in many ways, I just want to share two examples. I know that people say, you know, you can't make everyone happy. We understand that. We know because we're an alliance. It's like you cannot make everyone happy through the redistricting process. But we do think there are some really obvious examples where public comment was flat out ignored. And that was the concern for us why we decided to come here. Um, for example, between January and March, there were 80 public comments in support of keeping the Tenderloin and South of Market together and Cultural District, Whole and District 6. And there was very almost maybe one comment saying just the tender launch and move to a different district. But on March 25th, the task force adopted map 3B, which split the TL from the SOMA and from the cultural districts. And that had very minimal, little support from the public. And so I think it's a great question to ask people, well, why did you do that? Can you justify the rationale? Because we know there's hard choices to make, but honestly, the public felt that Thank there so was no rationale. Thank, Thank you sir. so much. Good, good evening, Commissioners. My name is Vitaly Gandhia, Central Director of Filipinas, working with Cultural Heritage District in San Francisco. Um, 
I've been working in District 6 for over 25 years. My three kids went to Bessie Carmichael School and um, was active in like the fight to rebuild Bessie Carmichael as the real school. Before that, it was World War II bungalows. We fought to actually build the first um, two, uh, two acre park, um, the Carmenola Dreams Park. Before that, there were no amenities in, in the South Market you know, for, for families. Um, we've been working with sort of seniors in the Tenderloin. Um, so many TIAs has been in the gateway community for, for our community for over 120 years. When we were first out in Manila Town, this is where we made home full 70s. And in the last um, in the last 10 years, we, hundreds of families were pushed out and priced out of, of this six, six. And at the same time, you have a, a growth of over 20,000 um, in District 6. So as soon as we heard about the, the census and the redistricting process, we knew it was really important for us to participate. We started con convening committee meetings weekly. Um, we, the task force told us we want to hear your communities of interest and we want you to define it. We met every, we had 14 different Filipino organizations actually map out over 50 uh, residents and places of worship and um, and restaurants and landmarks that was important for our community between the Tenderloin and the South of Market submitted that. We, um, <clears throat> that week we would participate in public comment. We not only worked within the Filipino community, but API communities. Um, we reached out to other um, community members in throughout SOMA, in the TL, Black communities, Southeast Asian, Arab. We met weekly to to really define the communities, LGBTQ communities, transgender cultural district, another district, and we actually worked to put together a, a community unity map. It's not mathematically impossible if you're actually trying to protect communities and not divide them. Thank and you for your comment. Your time is up. Well, Commissioners, uh, David Rue, uh, District 5 resident. We have tracked every public comment since the task force began community engagement meetings in January. And I'd like to share an example with you, um, not to judge what the match should be, but on how uh, members of the task force uh, have disregarded public uh, input of poor and working class communities of color. Between January and yesterday, there were 164 public comments that spoke to keeping the TL and SOMA and the cultural districts in D6 together. In addition, there were 146 comments in support of the community unity map, which keeps these boys together in District 6. And there were 193 comments in support of map 4D, which had the defining characteristic of being the only draft map that kept these communities together in District 6. There have been only 15 comments asking for the TL, the tender line, to move out of District 6. Yet on March 25th, the task force voted with the votes of member Castelli and Vice Chair Rayner to move forward with just one map that moved the tender going to District 5, uh, which virtually nobody in District 5, maybe one person asked for from District 5 self-identified. At their next uh, meeting on Saturday, April 2nd, 200 people waited hours to testify before the task force to urge the support for map 4D, which would keep the tenderloin and summit together in District 6. According to the tally, 118 public comments advocated for map 4D, while only 23 advocated for 4B. Um, and then they did vote uh, that day to move forward with map 4D. And this was the vote they reversed at their next 3 a.m. meeting. Um, and we've just seen systematically uh, as they cut through the map, um, prioritizing emerging with it, you know, wealthier neighborhoods. Um, and disregarding uh, specifically public comment employees submissions uh, from working class, low income neighborhoods, immigrants, people of color. Thank you so much. Uh, tenants. Thank you. Good evening. I'm charging my phone here, so I still have my notes. Uh, good evening. My name is John Wong, and I am a resident of District 5 on Mavona Street. Prior to that, I have, I'm also just about 70 years old, and I was born in Stockton for 69 and a half of those years I lived in San Francisco, starting in Chinatown in a single room occupancy, moving to the Mission District, moving to the Rich, Richmond District, uh, to the Mission District, to the Mission District, and right now to the Sunset. So I've had a sense of different communities. Also, since I am 70 years old, I've experienced seven census. 
And while all, many of them have involved redistricting, this is the first time I've been actively engaged in seeing what happens. The real question is, are the individuals appointed by this independent body in another independent task force doing their job? I have never met any of the individuals who spoke today who are on the task force, but I was very impressed. It was deliberative. They sought input. They received the input, they processed the input, and then it was included in their discussions with the final decisions. So when I see on the agenda item, it doesn't say decide whether or not to remove them. It's a discussion of possible actions regarding elections commission appointees to the San Francisco redistricting task force. I originally came up to implore you to not remove them. When I realized this, I urge you to applaud them for the work that they have done. Because it's clear from your process today, which is very basic and got information that was needed to help make your decisions, if through that process you selected these three individuals, thank you so much for give confidence for them. So thank you very much for the chance to make comments. Hello, good, uh, good evening. My name is Jessica Ho, and I'm here on behalf of my individual person. Um, I am a resident of District 4, and I also, I think John actually said a lot of what I wanted to say, which is that I originally came here because I had thought that this meeting was about the removal of the three redistricting uh, commission task force members. But in fact, I do think that there's merit on both sides. I do think that there needs to be a open process where everyone can improve where we can do better in listening to each other. And even in this meeting, there was no interpretation for seniors or the long ago seniors. And I understand that's something that we can all learn from that in the future, myself or other people, if we see that we should say something. And just like that, I think in the future, um, we see that there's always improvement to be made, but that's not any reason to be removed from a commission when they're just trying to do their job. And so I do agree that there should be you know, um, a dialogue of how we can all improve to be better public servants, but I don't think that it should result in the removal. And in fact, this is maybe something that we can uh, think about for the future, that because we have to go through all of these questions and decide what does it mean for someone to be um, a good redistricting task force member, this maybe will help inform the election commission in the future on how we can select the future uh, candidates for that. Thank you. Um, the first thing I want to say is the voter, the Voters Rights Act of 1965. They, that came into play because black people were being suppressed in this country. I'm really appalled today that even on this commission, there's not one black person here to hear and understand me. Racism is real. And San Francisco is one of the most racist cities in the nation. I, uh, I am a public worker. I work for the health department and I have experienced racism. And the other night, I have been going to these, these task force meetings since the very beginning and I have not missed one. I have been holding mapping meetings, information sessions in the community. There was no outreach done in District 10. I requested that AD 89, 2019, there's a template be sent out by this commission. I asked for the uh, to be sent out to all the people so that they can know that this is going on. The other night, Chesley Lee and Michelle Ho said they were put on that task force, and you should listen to the tape, to remove Patrol Hill from District 10. They are gerrymandering. They want to suppress the black vote. You shouldn't be rolling your eyes. So, um, I really hope you guys. Excuse me, I, I'm thinking about what you're saying. I'm not rolling my eyes. I, I'm just really concerned that there's a lot of white privilege going on in this room, and people are saying keep these people. But there was a Twitter today that said Chesley Lee was at a party. I we can't confirm it in 2018, saying he was going to gerrymander. So. He proved it because he came and said on the uh, task force meeting the other night that he was put on the commission, I mean, the task force to take out the Churl Hill. 
My father can watch for your comment. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Hello, um, my name is Brenda Barrows, and uh, I, I too have been, you know, staying up at night listening to and even if I wasn't physically here to the whole thing. And and I will say that one of the things and I've talked to my friends about it too is that when I heard one of the commissioners say, uh, quote unquote, that um, I'm going to take care of my people. Portola, I grew up in that area and I'm going to take care of my people. When you hear comments like that, he's not talking about all of us. You know what I mean? He's talking about his people. And based on what I see on this map, that's exactly what he has done. So um, that's all I will say on that. They're, 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 it, the comments are coming out of their mouths. That's not me saying that. He said that in an open meeting when he got upset. So um, you guys really need to, when people take these positions, they take, they should be taking an oath to maintain themselves a certain way. They should not be discriminating. They should not be making comments like that because that, that, that shows their bias. Because I'm, you know, I'm pushing the city hard on equity and bias. And what I've been hearing coming out of the mouths of some of the people in that commission is clearly bias. You can't call it anything else because that's what it is. So I, I hope you take that into consideration. And I know there are going to be people that support them. And I'm sure most of the people that support them are going to be, you know, my people that he was talking about. So uh, I just want to let you know what on my mind. Thank you. Hello, commissioners. Thank you for taking public comment. Took a while, but we got there. Um, you know, th there's been a lot of folks saying a lot of things in this meeting. We can talk pretty or we can speak plain. You know, uh, uh, this is about politics, plain and simple. You know, we know. Uh, uh, Commissioner Shapiro, that the DA gave you a call. We know Commissioner Jordanic that Supervisor Peskin gave you a call, and that's what led to the formation of this meeting. I'd add too, not within the traditional bounds of the Brown Act. Okay, every faction, every public body leaks. The truth gets out. All right, we know what this is about. I'm in kind of a unique position in that a lot of the folks who have been calling into question this meeting, uh, you know. There's not been much interest in the TL. I've been going out to these meetings and saying, you got to keep the TL, Mid-Market, Western Soma together. Um, you know, they, they made a decision uh, that I don't think is the right one, but they did give reasons. You know, they going into 4B, uh, if you're going to keep Treasure Island, the TL, and parts of Soma together, you need to cut into Western Soma to 7th Street. Um, again, you know, there, this is a tough process. But they, they did give justifications. I, I, I don't think that makes it right, but they can't be accused of doing it without having a reason. Now, these folks, the three that you're considering removing, are independent civil servants. They've served with the highest moral standards, the highest ethical standards, and with an empathy and a candor and a care for public input in what that means in this city. All right? I, I, it, <laughs> You have the votes. You can remove them. We all know it. No one's saying it. You can you can go for it. I mean, by all means. I don't think you've considered that that would be a national spectacle. I don't think you've considered that all the folks, myself included, who were abhorred on January 6th are also going to be abhorred about this. So I hope you make the right decision. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Jaime Valoria. I'm a resident, and I also work as an uh, organizer in the Tenderloin. And most of my work is around uh, voter turnout. Um, and I think, like, there's a lot of things today that seems to be twisted, right? And I do like that people have these stickers that says defend democracy. And that's exactly what we're trying to do in the redistricting. Right? We're ensuring that people who are marginalized, who always have barriers in voting, 
are able to be represented. And that's why I was in support of keeping uh, TL and SOMA together. When, when the changes happen in the middle of the night, the optics of that looks very suspicious. I don't have any evidence that they did anything shady, but the optics of it look suspicious. And this process in itself that we're doing, this is democracy, right? We ask you that we saw something shady. You all voted to have this hearing. It's not a sham. It's not a January 6th insurrection. It's not. So there's this kind of twistedness that I'm hearing. And also, it's really interesting that as soon as this came up, it became a political opportunity for a lot of people. I've heard Dean Preston's name a lot of this district meeting. Even Condi Chan's name was invoked. That's kind of interesting to me, right? It's supposed to be nonpartisan, but then there's this rhetoric that came out of this, right? And we're hearing people talking about the reason the problem with redistricting is because of housing policies. Well, that's true, but that's not the space for it. It's about who gets represented. Equity and representation. And that's what we were fighting for, is to keep these communities to have a voice. But then it's been twisted. We've been turning to numbers. And that's the whole point of redistricting force, is to listen to the communities of interest. And if they didn't listen and change it in the last minute, the, the optics of that is suspicious. And maybe they didn't mean to do it. It's been a long night. Maybe they were just being irresponsible. Thank but that's worth a hearing. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your comment. Commissioners, thank you for your time and efforts to try and listen to both sides. My name is Jade and I am a, I'm a resident of D4 and I am in support of the redistricting task force members to even entertain the idea of removing these task force members is absolutely outrageous. Just because one group got us got upset and threw a literal temper tantrum, you held this meeting. You need to be nonpartisan and not be pushed over by those who put them when you have supervisors. Excuse me. Excuse me. The the WebEx has See, lost the audio. Um. Oh my goodness. Let me call them again, Lucy. I'm sorry. 